what can member states do to uh, naturalize uh, non-citizen residents, in this case refugees in their midst. As far as local uh, elections is concerned, out of the eight case studies that we've looked at, uh, there's only one exception, i.e. Sweden, which allows uh, non-citizen residents or refugees with three or more years of residence in the country to vote in local and or provincial elections. Right, so but that is really an exception. Um, otherwise, all the other case studies really require citizenship, naturalization to vote either in local elections or national elections. And what happens? What happens when? In, this, in the cases where refugees actually gain uh, or acquire the right to vote, either uh, in cases like Sweden that allow voting uh, to local and regional elections even without citizenship, and uh, for people that have resided continuously in the country for three or more years, or in cases uh, where the refugees have managed to access uh, the citizenship of the host country after fulfilling the criteria that are set by the legal framework of each coast country. We found that despite having the formal right to vote, uh, refugees still encounter uh, a wide range of uh, challenges um, in their uh, attempt to effectively access uh, and exercise their voting rights. One of the challenges is the lack of uh, information and understanding of the political system in the host country. This uh, came up during uh, uh, many interviews in, in several host countries, uh, where uh, refugees specifically remarked that uh, they would uh, they, they would find very useful uh, for. Uh, to receive civic education and uh, to receive civic uh, voter information from a very early stage and not awaiting until they actually become eligible to vote. As it was um, noted uh, by one uh, Afghan refugee uh, in the UK, uh, what, what he said was that uh, we need uh, to receive information from day one. Uh, we shouldn't wait until we become naturalized citizens uh, because then we have the rights, but we don't understand how the system works. And many of us come from countries where uh, we haven't had the chance to uh, vote previously, or where the political system is completely different. So once we get access uh, to our voting rights, uh, we need to understand how uh, the political system works in the host country. Another uh, significant challenge uh, was the language barriers. And of course, language barriers uh, is always a big obstacle for integration and, and participation, not only in political life, but in, in, in many aspects of social life, uh, uh, employment, uh, etc. So for, for the full integration in the host country. And to that end, uh, indeed, many host countries like uh, Sweden um, and, uh, and Germany offer uh, language courses uh, for uh, newly arrived uh, refugees. Uh, so this is one mitigating measure um, of uh, ensuring that ensuring the smoother integration uh, into the host society. However, uh, we found that uh, there are persisting uh, barriers among women refugees uh, because uh, very often uh, women refugees uh, they have not received they have not had the chance to receive. A, a formal education in their origin country, and so when they move into the host country, uh, it is not it is not always uh, easy to access the language courses and to, to actually manage to learn uh, the language and to be effectively integrated um, into the host society. And then uh, the a general feeling of marginalization and discrimination. Uh, was another factor that uh, prevented uh, or uh, hindered refugees from their participation uh, as in many cases uh, they live either in the camps or they live in uh, neighborhoods uh, which are predominantly impacted by a uh, foreign population. Hence, they don't feel part of the host uh, society. Uh, but uh, they, 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 had, they expressed the feeling that uh, they, they were living in a parallel 
uh, in parallel realities, uh, so to speak. And then negative experiences uh, from origin countries. Uh, this uh, was this one was one of the findings that uh, emerged during uh, interviews with uh, different categories of refugees in many host countries. Uh, that given the fact that many of them were persecuted due to political reasons uh, from their origin country uh, and have experienced uh, uh, have experienced very negative um, uh, cases uh, of. Uh, uh, state uh, and authorities' reaction uh, towards their uh, attempt to participate in political life. Uh, they were hesitant or traumatized, and they were not willing to. Um, they were not willing to participate in the host country politics, as uh, it was uh, characteristically said uh, by one Somali refugee in Kenya. Um, bad politics uh, brought us out of our origin country. Why start? Uh, messing up with politics again uh, here in the host country. Let us enjoy uh, their peace and, uh, and the freedom. So that that is a telling example of of, uh, of why uh, the experiences from the origin country play a big role uh, in overcoming the barriers to effective political participation in the host country. And then another key challenge is the lack of awareness. The lack of awareness of how how and why it is important to be involved in political life, uh, why uh, your voice uh, should be heard, and, uh, and why uh, it is important to exercise uh, political rights in the host country. Uh, we saw in uh, many cases, uh, for example, among um, some of the Syrian refugees in Sweden, uh, that they did not consider themselves as part of the host society, and they didn't feel that they would have legitimacy uh, to exercise the right to vote, even if they formally had this right. Uh, they, they didn't feel that they had, uh, that they were, uh, they, they had the ethical, uh, the, the, the ethical necessity to exercise this right. So, uh, those are some of the uh, obstacles along the way. Uh, some of them are quite understandable as to why refugees uh, can't or will not necessarily participate uh, politically in the host country. We looked at other mechanisms of uh, participation as well. Uh, and uh, we found out that uh, in, if not for uh, if not for the right to vote, if they don't practice or they can't exercise the right to vote in the host country, there are actually there is also uh, we talk in the report a little bit about membership in political parties. Right in different uh, countries, we've seen that actually uh, depending on the statutes, individual statutes of political parties in various host countries, uh, they might actually give. Uh, they might be open to uh, receiving in their midst members from the refugee community, regardless of the fact uh, whether they have uh, citizenship or not in their host country. So that is an aspect we, we've also looked at, and it's an aspect of uh, of the exercise of the of the uh, right to participate politically in the host country and represent in a way the uh, interests and the concerns of the community you come from, or the constituency you come from. In addition to that, we've also looked at the so-called um, consultative bodies, and that refers specifically to these bodies, consultative bodies, but at the same time it just refers to uh, bodies which uh, um, have been on the use in, uh, have been practiced in some countries uh, more, and some countries in a, to a lesser degree. I'll give you a couple of examples. And since this is a comparative analysis, I also sort of want to look out, outside of the box a little bit, as we're going to be dwelling more on the case study of the Uganda later on. But in Europe, for instance, there is a, the Council of Europe passed a uh, convention on consulting bodies back in 1992, which was then uh, enacted in 1997, urging really uh, member states to uh, form uh, consultative bodies, which are essentially um, 
mechanisms that enable entities that enable um, refugees to become members of these bodies at the local level and then together with local authorities represent the interests and the advocate for the rights and the interests of the refugee communities at the local level. If I can make sort of a, a daring comparison with the case study of Uganda, here uh, there are the refugee welfare councils, right, in, in camps and settlements, um, which also have a role to play in terms of uh, making the link of the, interact or the interaction between uh, government, between particularly the office of the Prime Minister, the OPM, right, and the refugee communities residing in those settlements and camps with the uh, role of uh, uh, facilitating service provision and coordinating and so on and so forth. So also consulting bodies in Europe, particularly say in the case study of Germany, uh, Germany has been quite successful in uh, enacting this particular Council of Europe convention by way of uh, establishing these consulting bodies at the state level. Uh, and so there are numerous of these consulting bodies which are formed and uh, they uh, uh, enjoy membership of refugees in their midst together with uh, citizens, uh, German citizens. And together, of course, the role is to advocate for the rights of uh, refugee communities in those uh, cities uh, where they live. The downside to these uh, consultative bodies, I would say maybe the same would apply to the RWCs here, is that, uh, of course, they don't have an executive function, a decision-making function. They have an advisory role, um, and they are there to uh, supplement, in a way, with uh, advocacy uh, activities, with advice, uh, representing the rights and the interests of the refugees concerned. So I think there is space here, as we'll see later with recommendations, there is space here for the empowerment of these bodies, be that consultative bodies like we have them in different countries in Europe, particularly in Germany, or uh, the likes of RWCs in the case study of, uh, of Uganda. So that is another point that we want to raise. Thanks. Let's turn now to the, to the participation in, uh, in origin countries. And, and before, uh, before I say, before I start speaking about the non-formal participation, I would just like to say a few words about formal participation in the origin countries. So we have examined uh, out-of-country voting we have considered the mechanisms of out-of-country voting whenever this is uh, legally and technically uh, possible. Out of the five uh, origin countries that we examined, two countries uh, have uh, regulations for out-of-country voting, uh, Afghanistan and Syria. Uh, but even in this, even in those cases, uh, uh, there, there have been a lot of challenges uh, as, uh, as it is. Uh, characteristically stated, uh, uh, as it was characteristically stated by many uh, Syrian refugees, for example, uh, the out of the, the exercise uh, of out of country voting uh, was restricted only to legal expatriates. This means that uh, the person who uh, who would be eligible to vote uh, should have left the origin country legally. Uh, with an exit stamp, and of course, uh, in, in the most cases, this is not uh, this is not the case uh, when uh, one person has to flee uh, their country and, uh, because uh, they are being persecuted. Uh, well, in the case of Afghanistan, um, out-of-country voting was exercised uh, in, the, in the first transitional elections uh, back in 2004. And there, it was only possible for refugees that were based uh, in uh, neighboring Iran and Pakistan, or which are uh, countries that were hosting very high numbers of, uh, of Afghan refugees. But it was not uh, accessible, uh, te technically uh, possible, for uh, Afghan refugees that were residing in any other country uh, in the world. And until then, uh, there has been no uh, possibility uh, for out-of-country voting. Uh, despite, uh, despite the existence of uh, legal provision uh, in the electoral framework that says that uh, refugees can, so it is, uh, it is not an obligation, but refugees can exercise their right to vote in embassies abroad, 
Uh, as far as, as we know to date, uh, there has been no special arrangements for, for the exercise of out of, out of country voting in the upcoming um, autumn elections, um, which are due later this year. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we also looked into the cases of uh, participation as a candidate. And this, is a, this, was, this was a very interesting case. Uh, and it has a lot, uh, it depends a lot on whether or not the host and the origin countries allow uh, dual citizenship. Uh, we saw that, uh, for example, in the case of uh, Somalia, uh, so Somalia has been, as you know, it has been in a, in a protracted situation of conflict since 1991, so many of the refugees, uh, especially the ones that have arrived in, in Sweden, uh, they have been naturalized after living so many years um, in the host country. So they hold Swedish citizenship, but still hold the Somali citizenship also. And, and uh, we saw that um, in, the, in, the, in the most recent elections in 2016 and 2017, the diaspora and candidates from the diaspora uh, played a big role uh, in, uh, in the elections, either participating as candidates uh, it is remarkable that uh, almost half uh, of, the, of the presidential candidates were dual citizenship holders and the person that was actually elected as, as president that is currently serving as president uh, is uh, Somali American. Uh, but we also saw that the diaspora can play a big uh, role in uh, supporting political parties or candidates of their choice uh, through other means. Uh, for example, the European Union uh, assessment mission uh, to the Somali elections found uh, that uh, the Somali diaspora uh, played a big role by sending remittances and financial support uh, for uh, the campaigns uh, of, se of several candidates, although there is no concrete uh, evidence of this. Uh, and also this came up during uh, the interviews with, uh, with Somali refugees uh, in Sweden, uh, who said that uh, the diaspora can play a big role uh, because they can advocate uh, and they can support uh, uh, certain candidates uh, in, and also convince uh, or try to convince uh, family members uh, back home to, uh, to support and to vote for these candidates. Another interesting case uh, is the case of, uh, and now I will and now we go into the non-formal political participation. Another interesting case is the case of the Afghan diaspora um, in the UK. The interviews revealed that uh, before uh, the latest elections uh, in 2012, uh, there was uh, an online uh, uh, there was an online platform that was established by Afghans living in uh, in the UK. Uh, where people could debate about uh, politics and about uh, the and participate in the in the electoral campaign and view uh, and express their views about uh, one candidate or another. And uh, as and as as it was um, noted uh, by many Afghan refugees, uh, technology helped us overcome the barriers of refugee life. So uh, the role of social media and uh, the role of technology is an important aspect when it comes to non-formal political participation. Uh, when even uh, when people don't don't have the right to vote, they can still uh, uh, express their views and they can still try to influence. Uh, the political situation or the outcome uh, of the electoral processes back home. Uh, another mix of uh, non-formal political participation that is included uh, was included in, in the research and in the report uh, is the participation in civil society organizations, and uh, we will hear more during the second uh, session uh, of today. Uh, civil society organizations, either established or led by, by refugees, uh, in the host country and doing activities uh, to support the refugee communities uh, and to engage uh, to, to engage in civic and political life the refugee communities either in the host country or in the origin country. Again, an example of uh, the Somali refugees in uh, in Sweden, uh, a positive a positive example um, of civil society organizations that are established in the host country but implement projects in the origin country, uh, projects uh, that involve capacity building, uh, leadership uh, building skills, 
um, civic education, uh, human rights education, uh, voter education, uh, that is led by civil society organizations based in the host country but actually operating in the origin country or supporting and collaborating with uh, CSOs in the origin country. And last but not least, uh, the role of protests, the role of informal, uh, the, the, the role of uh, informal initiatives, uh, uh, which uh, often mobilize uh, refugee communities uh, for uh, raising awareness uh, towards the political situation in their origin countries, uh, in order to put pressure on the international community, to put pressure on the government of the host or the government of the origin country, and to vocalize. Uh, their opinion and, and, and their complaints about uh, the, the situation uh, back home. Um, I will stop now here and uh, maybe we can take one round of uh, questions. And, or, yes, okay, let's, let's uh, move into the presentations now, yes. Yeah. Okay, so. Um So we, uh, the report in the end uh, comes up with a number of recommendations, right? And uh, just more here yes. so that you have a look at them before I proceed. The uh, challenge that we had methodologically with this report is that we had eight uh, various uh, countries of uh, host countries and five countries of origin, all of them with their own. Uh, you know, trajectories of development, their own political dynamics, socio-economic uh, circumstances, quite different from one another, of course. And so, um, you know, we could either come up with uh, numerous recommendations for each host country and then for each country of origin, uh, which would have been very tiring and most likely not effective at all, or uh, go for the other option, which we did, which is to. Uh, uh, come up with a concise number of recommendations, not too many of them, which uh, would apply, which are basically divided into two categories. One category uh, targeting specifically host countries and another one targeting specifically the countries of origin. But uh, once the um, recommendations are aimed to be uh, as so-called as actionable as possible, right, for the uh, addressees concerned, at the same time they are sort of general enough so that um, they can apply to all these different countries, regardless of whether we talk about Uganda, Kenya, Germany, Lebanon, and so on and so forth. And uh, they are addressed to different sort of stakeholders. Uh, they target the governments, respective governments of these countries. They target uh, political parties, of course, as very, uh, uh, as key players in enabling or not enabling the participation of refugees into politics. They, of course, target civil society organizations. We talked about the non-formal mechanisms of participation. And they target, of course, uh, in, in, uh, regional and or international organizations who also have a very active role to play, such as UNHCR, for instance, IOM, OSCE, and so on and so forth. And I, I see that there are representatives of such organizations in the uh, audience here today. And so without uh, going through all of them uh, one by one, I will just quickly mention a couple of them. The, one, the, the first one, we, we mentioned naturalization and access to citizenship, or the, hint, the obstacles to naturalization, as being uh, that key factor that uh, enables or doesn't enable refugees actually to participate politically formally in the host country. And so one recommendation um, makes sort of a call to, um, to the governments of the host countries to uh, do more, to be more proactive in terms of um, implementing Article 34 specifically of the 1951 Refugee Convention. Or even in uh, the African context, the 1969 Organization of African Unity Convention. Right. Now, we understand that each country has its political dynamics. We understand that, say, in the case, the case study of Uganda, um, there is a very uh, long process to naturalization, and naturalization might not even happen. 
regardless of the duration of the stay of refugees in this country. There are the cases such as, say, uh, Germany that have made uh, progress in the last uh, decade or so in uh, reducing the number of years that a ref refugee needs to, uh, to be in the country in order to be entitled to citizenship, right? Uh, but I think regardless of which country we are talking about, out of all these case studies that we are mentioning, there is really room for each government of each host country to revisit the uh, Refugee Convention, specifically Article 34 that talks about naturalization and assimilation of non-citizen residents, particularly refugees, um, as at some point um, of their duration of their stay in the host country, this becomes their country, and so in order to participate politically, in order to complete, be able to completely fulfill their right to express politically, um, they need to naturalize, naturalize, and that's precondition, and that's why we make a call for um, uh, maybe a, a, a more practical implementation of that particular commitment. We are, of course, there are other recommendations in so far as uh, host countries is concerned. I will just maybe quickly mention the second one, which is to enhance support provided to migrants and to, uh, uh, and to uh, migrant representative bodies and to uh, uh, expedite those links between uh, the migrant representative bodies. We mentioned the consultative bodies. We mentioned RWCs in the Ugandan context and the local authorities, right? To be more practical in terms of empowering those bodies that, uh, whose aim and objective is to uh, represent the interests of the refugee communities and to advocate for their, for their rights. As far as international and regional organizations is concerned, to support the implementation of mechanisms for engagement with participation and consultation, uh, there are other recommendations that uh, refer to international and, uh, and regional organizations, uh, but more on that is uh, we can talk about those later on, and also you can find them in the report. And one last point that I want to mention is the, uh, we mentioned the OCBs, the out-of-country voting mechanisms, right? It's a very uh, complex undertaking, log logistically, technically, politically, and we understand, of course, the uh, intricacies around it. We mentioned that uh, Afghanistan had a, um, a successful round, relatively successful round, but then that went down. But I think there is still a lot of room uh, for the countries of origin in this particular case to at least uh, put some kind of legal framework in place that uh, um, aims to uh, accommodate the right of uh, the diaspora communities to have the right to vote. And whether, whether that right to vote comes into operation is, uh, pen is pending on, those, uh, on over overcoming those um, obstacles that I mentioned above. But at least uh, there is really more room for countries of origin, particularly, to to uh, work in the uh, in the process of out of country voting. I'll stop here because uh, I'm told that we are all with you. Thanks. So uh, we will uh, we will not take a round of questions now. Uh, we will rather continue with the uh, with the following panel uh, that will present each of the cases uh, of Uganda, Kenya, and South Africa. And then we can take the questions for uh, both for the report and for the case studies separately. So I would like to call uh, to the panel, uh, Ms. Tigrana Zaharyan, uh, the author of the case study uh, of uh, uh, the case of Congolese and South Sudanese refugees in Uganda. Ms. Mukongi Peya, uh, the author of uh, the case of uh, Congolese refugees in South Africa. And Victor Miyamori, refugee officer at Amnesty International Kenya. Tigrana Mukongi and Victor will give us a brief overview uh, of the situation uh, in uh, these three uh, host countries. And let's start with the case of Uganda. 
Thank you, everybody. I'm very happy to see such a diverse uh, group of people here with us. For those of you who are standing, I know that they are bringing more chairs, so please bear with us. Uh, my name is Tigrana Zakarian. I have the privilege of authoring the Uganda case study, uh, which specifically looks at Congolese and South Sudanese refugees and their abilities to uh, to engage in the political processes, both through formal and informal political platforms here in Uganda, as well as through civil society and diaspora organizations, respectively. Uh, and then. In the same light, it looks at their ability to impact the democratic processes or lack thereof in their origin countries and the platforms that exist for that. Um, so Uganda's refugee policy overall has gained a very uh, positive reputation internationally for its ability to accommodate mass flows of refugees and asylum seekers into its borders. And so the question is, what exactly happens after the reception of refugees? In the sense of how do they establish their livelihoods and their decision-making abilities, both in terms of humanitarian efforts, development, and then how do they actually go about making decisions on repatriation or moving forward to another third country? There's three, formally, there's three um, durable solutions for refugees, which I'm sure all of you know. It's repatriation to your country of origin, global integration into the country of asylum, or its resettlement through a formal platform into a third party country. Now, the question is, how compatible is that with uh, the current refugee management structure, and especially in the case of Uganda, where refugees are not given the formal platforms to politically and civically engage. So my study explores what are the ways that refugees and asylum seekers look beyond those restrictions and the, and the creative means that they go about both engaging in DRC and South Sudan respectively, and then also establishing a sense of political participation and civil engagement here in Uganda. Uh, so the data that was collected, just to give you an overview, it was in Napa Valley Refugee Settlement in Singiro District, where we, where we sampled the uh, Congolese refugee community, where you have longer standing uh, Congolese communities who have been here since the 1990s, all the way until more recent arrivals of uh, Congolese asylum seekers, as well as Adimani District in West Nile, where four different refugee settlements were sampled. I, I don't know for those of you who have been to Adimani or know about it, there's about 22 or 23 different settlements, and they host various ethnic, ethnic groups as well as refugees from various regions of South Sudan. So, we made sure to sample at least four of the settlements to make sure that it was as inclusive as possible. And at the time when we did the research, it was in April of 2017, Mar March and April 2017, and took the chance of going to Bitty Bitty, uh, knowing that there would definitely be some restrictions because it was just emerging out of the uh, emergency response with the, with the major inflow into Yumbe district. And uh, I think it was definitely a good choice to go there because we were able to see rapidly in the sense of how refugees are actually starting to organize themselves and establish a sense of normal livelihood structures uh, following their flight. And of course, we sampled Kampala for the urban refugee communities who, uh, for those of you who don't know, urban communities here in Kampala actually don't receive any forms of humanitarian assistance because the assumption is if you have foregone a refugee settlement, then there's a, a level of self-reliance you can uh, exercise here in the urban communities. So it was it was interesting to, to get that um, aspect. And of course, we used existing refugee leadership structures. So the refugee welfare committees, as Armand and Rina have mentioned, in the settlements, as well as diaspora associations and civil society organizations throughout the settlements and in Kampala. Uh, and we also, of course, engaged the Office of the Prime Minister, Department for Refugees, and uh, various INGOs, uh, international nonprofit organizations that are working specifically with, with uh, refugees and asylum seekers. So to go into the details more or less, and I think all of you actually have a full report, so I'll just be giving a, a brief overview. The Refugee Act of 2006 and the regulations of 2010 uh, are the provisions, legal provisions, that um, manage all refugee-related activities in Uganda. And 
the way that the Ugandan refugee management context is very different from other countries that were included in the consolidated report is the fact that refugees are actually um, they're used as an agent of development here in Uganda, meaning that they're integrated into the national development plan as well as in the local district plans for, for development. Refugees are a part of, of that factor, and that's to include a more inclusive way of development both for host communities and refugees and to promote positive social cohesion between the two communities. Uh, however, looking at beyond just humanitarian and development initiatives when considering political participation in Uganda, um, conventional means through formal participation in national or local elections, access to political parties, the right to assembly, they're not extended to refugees or asylum seekers in Uganda, and uh, within the Refugee Act, Article 29 explicitly states that refugees have the right uh, of association as regards to non-political and non-profit making associations and trade unions, but political activity, either at a local or national level, is prohibited. Um, further, a recognized refugee shall not engage in any political activity within Uganda, whether at a local or national level, and they're, they're not allowed to undertake any political activities within Uganda against any country, including his or her country of origin. So. That, that, those are the bylaws, uh, respectively, as you can see. Um, and the restrictions on refugees engaging in Ugandan politics or the political affairs of their origin countries are generally justified as the need to, to disengage from the bad politics that have caused their exile. So that's the justification, meaning they have, they have fled their countries for political reasons, therefore they should stay away from politics that have, they should stay away from the politics that have resu resulted in their flight. Um, and that was echoed multiple times, both by those working in INGOs, service providers, as well as government officials. So the question then is that uh, beyond a welcoming asylum policy, uh, what actually exists for, for refugees to have that sense of self-determination to, to decide on, okay, can I engage in the, in the political processes of my origin country I've fled due to instability and due to bad politics, but how can I change that while I am in exile? Many of the people we interviewed, they also talked about the positive aspects of being in Uganda, the fact that they're able to, to enjoy a sense of physical security, for instance. Um, many times what I hear is, yes, I'm not able to have the basic freedoms that I had, maybe in my country of origin when it comes to political participation, but I don't hear bullets when I sleep at night and I'm able to have that sense of physical security and people are indeed thankful for the fact that Uganda has granted them asylum. Uh, so when we're talking about formal means of political participation, and I think that was, that was demonstrated in all of the eight country studies, it's, is there a legal path to citizenship uh, for refugees and asylum seekers? Here in Uganda, we have multi-generational refugees at this point, whether they're in the urban areas or in the camps. We have refugees that have been here for multiple generations that are born in Uganda. However, the path to legal forms of citizenship remain limited for them. Um, the Ugandan constitution says that you need to be in Uganda for at least 20 years to, uh, to, natu to naturalize. However, when we were doing this research, we found that through the formal channels of naturalization, there have been no successful cases so far. It was confirmed to us by the Office of the Prime Minister that they are working with the Ministry of Internal Affairs to, there's a select group of refugees who have been here for a protracted period of time and they are making recommendations on those who should be eligible for status. So perhaps that's a follow-up project for us to do in the future. Um, and. As I said, the Congolese and South Sudanese refugees commonly uh, express their gratitude uh, to the government of Uganda for the physical security and safety, but conveyed their frustrations for the fact that they continue to have refugee status over and over and over again, and they don't feel a sense of security by just merely being called a refugee. Okay, I'm a refugee one year, five years, ten years, but I can't continue to be a refugee my entire life. So what, what are the implications of that? And talking about citizenship, it wasn't necessarily the fact that people felt a deep sense of national allegiance to Uganda, but it was the fact that they felt that they would be able to compete against the Ugandan job market and exercise a higher level of integration if those, those formal means of naturalization were available and open to them. 
Um, in terms of the further formalities, the refugee welfare committees, they're structures that exist within the refugee settlements, and they, they have elected leadership, and they serve as liaisons to the office of the prime minister. Most of the time, the issues that they are handling, and I know we have a few Rousey leaders here in this room, so please engage with them during the open dialogue, it's, it's to really uh, engage in the day-to-day -day realities of what it means to actually manage a refugee settlement. So everything from food ration distribution to making sure that communication is mainstreamed to their communities, to handling more household community-based uh, conflicts. Uh, but people didn't really understand where their mandate starts and where it ends, in the sense of how deeply can I engage with the stakeholders, whether they be the government of Uganda, donors, INGOs, those working on my behalf, how deeply can I actually serve my community and be consulted and also uh, have a sense of, of voice in terms of advocating for the needs of my community. So uh, it was expressed to us as a one-way stream of communication uh, in terms of the refugee management overall. Uh, and then of course we go to the non-formal political participation. Um, and a lot of this was Again, along the lines of refugees can organize themselves through politics, church, not, I'm sorry, not politics, um, non-political activities, so church, arts, cultural practices, as long as they are non-political. And what we found was that people found ways of getting creative about that. So yes, they're not able to directly politically engage, but they did it through leadership training, education, and other means because it was it, it still was fueled by this long-term vision of, yes, we are refugees here in Uganda, but eventually, if we have the hope of going back to our countries, we don't want to be idle and we don't want to waste this time we had as refugees, and we want to make sure that we're developing the skills and progressing in a productive manner. That way, when we go back to our origin countries, we're productive and we can contribute to our society. And of course, therein also lies that paradox and that challenge because the longer people remain exiled and are outside of their countries of origin, they also lose credibility among the, the local communities and their countries of origin for various reasons, right? So I'm, I'm sure for those of you who have the diaspora experience beyond just being a refugee, you, you, can, you can relate to that. Um, and then in terms of formal participation both in while you're a refugee in South Sudan and DRC. Um, at the moment, I mean, we're all aware of the peace efforts that are taking place in South Sudan, and that is something that has happened following the research that we undertook. But South Sudanese refugees, they, there's this collective memory that many have about, I believe, uh, there were about 12,000 South Sudanese refugees that voted for a, for a referendum in South Sudan for South Sudanese independence. And there's this collective memory of being driven to the border point between Uganda and South Sudan and casting their vote. And, you know, I, there's a quote I have, to, I have to read just to give you some context in terms of uh, both the memory and the, and the disappointment they now feel because they're refugees again. So someone I interviewed, he said, this is my third time running to Uganda. The diaspora were the ones who struggled for independence. We struggled for this referendum so it can be a safe country. All of the women struggled so there can be peace, yet we are the ones who suffer while men can run to the bush. It is useless for us to participate now. If there is a new person, not Kira Mushar, we might struggle and cast votes. Otherwise, any voting would be meaningless. So that should just give you a sense of the feelings there are now in terms of, you know, there's people who are multiple times become refugees, and at some point you establish a sense of normal, normalcy here in Uganda, or maybe it's Ethiopia or Kenya, and then you repatriate, you go back to your country of origin, and then you end up as a refugee again. So the research really revealed both a strong willingness to engage, as well as a willingness, a lack of willingness to engage at all, both among the, the Congolese and the, the South Sudanese communities. And in Congo, we haven't seen specifically a drive for refugees to be included in, in the political transition of power there. The government has announced that they will, will hold elections in 2018, but there haven't been talks of actually including the Congolese diaspora or the refugees in, in that process. And when we interviewed refugees 
particularly in the settlements and um, in the urban communities, people talked about the technicalities of what would also prevent them from voting in, in the sense of not having access to national ID cards and all of the bureaucratic measures that they would have to take in order to actually cast a vote and on top of you know taking the, the very serious risk of going back to Congo because there are no out of country voting measures. I'm out of time, but uh, let's definitely engage more in the recommendations. So I welcome your questions on that and thank you. Thank you very much, Sibirana. Thank you for this very interesting overview, and uh, I will turn to Bukondi. Bukondi, please take the microphone. Bukondi has conducted the research uh, in South Africa, uh, interviewing respondents from uh, the DRC. Bukondi, the floor is yours. also known as Mugondi. Um, I did the case study on uh, South Africa, specifically looking at Congolese refugees that are residing in South Africa, but also um, asylum seekers. Um, before I start, I want to make um, an offer, if you like. I live in Botswana, and I do a lot of interaction with the refugee community in Botswana as well. So in my presentation, I'm going to make um, Comparison, comparisons or comparative remarks about the context in Mozambique so that we see South Africa and um, its policies and approaches within a regional context um, because there are quite a few similarities but there are also quite a number of differences. Um, you will excuse my voice, I have a horrible cold that I'm struggling to shake off. Um, so my title slide as you can see, can we have our political rights please? Um, this is, I think, at the heart of the discussion that we're having today. Um, does being a refugee or an asylum seeker, being forced to flee your country, mean you abandon your political identity, but also your political participation and political rights? Do you have to choose between survival, being alive, and being politically active? And what is, what is it that entitles us as citizens in our home countries to have these rights that others are denied, and where are they supposed to have them, and what are we doing to facilitate that access? Hence, my title slide. Um, host country context. South Africa, as most of you probably know, came out of a um, historically unjust political system where minority, a, a small minority ruled um, an overwhelming majority, a majority um, in a system known as apartheid. Um, and in 1994, we had our first democratic elections where for the first time, one person over the age of 18 was allowed to have one vote, regardless of color, race, or creed. Um, and this gave birth to what is known across the world as the Rainbow Nation. Of course, we know at the end of a rainbow there's supposed to be a pot of gold, and that is what we are all seeking, including people who migrate to South Africa. South Africa has historically been a migrant um, destination. Um, even before the dawn of democracy, people used to come to South Africa to work in the mines, people from neighboring countries, unskilled, semi-skilled labor. Um, you will also know that during apartheid, um, some of the provinces or districts in South Africa were actually countries um, that were recognized only by South Africa internationally. So some of the tribes, smaller tribes, and the medium ones, Zulus, Vendas, Kosas, and so forth, um, were actually countries on their own that sent labor to South Africa. Um, come the end of apartheid, now we became one country, and all of us suddenly became citizens and no longer migrant workers working in South Africa. Um, but because of the political situation in the country, South Africa was also a refugee sending country. A lot of people who were um, in political exile went to neighboring countries. Um, some came as far as Uganda, Tanzania, um, 
East, South of East and other Southern African neighboring countries were the main destinations. And that was um, the migration pattern in South Africa before, uh, during apartheid and before the dawn of democracy. Come the end of apartheid, 1994, um, we have a very big population. We are sitting at about 56 million people, um, give or take, because statistics are a problem generally. Um, very diverse because we are merging different cultures, different ethnic groups who also historically have got their own tensions. A very youthful population um, that is characterized also by high unemployment and dependency on government grants and um, social systems and social welfare. Um, we have a high number of unskilled and semi-skilled um, people within our population. These are um, citizens of South Africa, children born in South Africa, who have just not gone to school because of the apartheid system and what we inherited. Um, add to that, we've got porous borders, poor security, um, a big geographic space to manage, um, and also the issues of crime and corruption. It means migration happens very easily into South Africa, but also out of South Africa, migration of people, including smuggling and trafficking, but also migration of arms, illicit goods, and so forth. Um, this sounds very attractive if you're in the business of um, organized crime, but also if you're looking for work. In Southern Africa, we've got a big um, unemployment problem. We've got a big skills problem. So a lot of people come to South Africa looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, and they use whatever means is available to them. Unfortunately, there's no migration policy in South Africa that caters for unskilled and semi-skilled labor. South Africa is trying to attract um, highly skilled, scarce skills, um, as they call them, um, and everyone else falls between the cracks. Um, and because there's a non-encampment refugee policy, where it's quite easy for people to come in and lodge a claim for asylum and um, get a, a, an entry permit while the, the claim is being adjudicated, People come in generally looking for work, but come and present themselves as asylum seekers. Um, the adjudication process takes anything between six months and 16 years, give or take. So within that time, you're able to move around the system, you're able to work, you're able to go to school, establish yourself, establish business and bring family. And that is what has led to an inflation in the um, refugee and asylum seeker statistics of South Africa. It is because of the permitting and policy gaps that are there. Um, of course, the promise of possible progression to citizenship um, also is a core factor for many people who want to come to South Africa. Unfortunately, with the time, um, things are not as easy and the progression is not as smooth, um, but still it is better than being unemployed, being hungry where there's poor um, social support and services in your own country. So that is the host country context. Um, so looking specifically at refugees, uh, Congolese refugees and asylum seekers, who are they? Um, it is a mixed group, women, children, men, some come as families, some come as young people um, individually looking for opportunities but also generally um, fleeing persecution. Um, because of the political uh, context and the evolution of the political dynamics in the DRC, some are more refugees than others. This means uh, people that come from Eastern DRC find it easier to, to get into the system to be accepted also as refugees than people who come from Kinshasa where the world is led to believe that there is peace. Um, but also this has got its own tensions and other dynamics that it creates amongst the refugee community themselves. Um, there's of course intergroup conflict because People have got different political experiences, different political opinions, um, and they want change and see it coming in different ways. Um, but within that, there's also intra-group conflict. Um, for example, uh, the combatants, um, who is a certain group within the Congolese um, refugee community who are seen to be against Kabila and are a lot more militant. Um, amongst themselves don't have a common position on the strategies and tactics that they should be applying. And you'll find um, some of the issues or um, tensions that they face are around a violent and non-violent struggle 
pol uh, political engagement versus diplomacy using the media and so forth. So there is also um, a lot of tension even amongst themselves as the refugees. But over and above that, um, refugees and asylum seekers in South Africa just really want to be given an opportunity to live and um, create uh, a conducive environment for themselves and their children to be able to um, prosper and grow. Unfortunately, having a lifelong label of being an asylum seeker or refugee does not allow for that opportunity. Um, but if you just suppose this experience with the Botswana one, in some ways South Africa is a bit better. In Botswana, you come into the country as an asylum seeker and upon presenting yourself at the border, you're put into um, the center for illegal immigrants, which is basically a prison. While your claim is being adjudicated, you can be there in for anything between a month and years. The typical prison-like conditions where they lock everybody up at four o'clock and you come out the following day. Women, children, men, everybody was in there. Um, once your application has been assessed and you are successful, you get sent into a camp. There's only one camp, um, which is about 500 kilometers from the capital city. And you basically go and stay there all your life until there's a cessation clause and then you are voluntarily repatriated. There's no possibility of um, access to citizenship at any point. Um, you have access to basic services, schools, med uh, medical attention, and so forth, but only up until the end of high school. There's no opportunity for the government to sponsor you for um, formal education um, beyond high school. Um, but the, the, the first voluntary repatriation for me is the most problematic, because even if you stay in that country for 30, 40 years, get married even with locals, at the end of um, that uh, refugee status internationally, you are forced to leave the country. And whether that leads to um, separation of the family unit or not is immaterial. Whether you've got roots in your country of origin is also immaterial. So if you look at things in that perspective, South Africa is not as terrible as it could be. Um, the issue of political participation. Similar to, um, to the context um, outlined, you have to be joking outlined by Lina and, and, and um, Tigrana. Uh, legally, it's very difficult for refugees and asylum seekers and non-South Africans in general to participate formally um, in political processes. Um, Pre-1994, there was a draft constitution uh, which actually made provision for um, residents, permanent residents to vote. So in the 1994 elections, there are some respondents that I interviewed who said that they had actually voted um, as non-South Africans in the South African um, in the South African presidential and local government elections. Um, but outside of voting and being members of political parties, establishing political parties, um, people participate through civil society organizations. They organize themselves. But um, one of the good things about South Africa again is that people are allowed to express political opinions, both about the South African context, but also politics at home. So unlike um, in the case in Uganda, unlike the case in Botswana, it is not a, a, an offense to express political opinion about the situation in your country, but also the situation in the host country. Um, the uh, people are free to, to protest peacefully, as long as they get permission or inform authorities. And people are basically allowed to go about their business. I think this is also related to um, the non incumbent policy because uh, beyond offering permits, the government doesn't provide any services to refugees and asylum seekers at all. So um, by giving them an opportunity to get organized and interact with others, they also give them access in some ways to livelihood opportunities. Um, and I think this is part of the trade-off that has to be made. Um, I will skip this slide um, because it's quite it's covered quite elaborately in um, my paper. Um, but in conclusion, I think that what we are seeing um, as the refugee situation in in South Africa is really an interconnected set of dynamics. Um, the DRC and South Africa have got very intricate, complex political business and other linkages. Um, that make it difficult for the South African government to take a decisive stance um, in resolving the political crisis in the DRC. And this, unfortunately, um, 
has got a direct consequence on the lives and livelihoods of refugees and asylum seekers. Um, related to this, of course, is the issue of corruption, uh, which is something that we are struggling with uh, and dealing with um, as Southern Africa, but also as South Africa in particular. Um, this also has led to a politicization of state and administrative functions. So permitting is suddenly a political issue. Um, accepting and, and, and accommodating refugees, migrants, asylum seekers, and so forth is a highly politicized issue in South Africa. Every single day, people are being deported. Every single day, informal houses are being um, demolished. And there's widespread xenophobia in South Africa because of our own internal socioeconomic challenges as well. But the police are also playing a role in this politicized um, state um, function application. There's of course political interference and conspiracy. Some of the people that I interviewed said they only go to a certain, um, to a certain number um, of doctors who are pre-selected because there are some doctors that are colluding with the government to murder um, or kill refugees and problematic asylum seekers who make too much noise about the regime in the DRC. And this raises <coughs> issues of also rule by law versus rule of law. Um, sometimes giving, uh, not giving permission for protests to take place and applying um, the municipal bylaws and citing certain um, requirements that are in the book just to make it difficult for people to express political um, to express different political opinions, um, and also to embarrass visitors. Usually, the protests happen when President Kabila or his representatives are in town, and usually um, uh, the, the response will be an administrative note that makes it impossible for the protest to take place. So the the law is being used to deny people their rights. Lastly, we are seeing a decline in the policy environment. South Africa recently passed the White Paper on International Migration, which seeks to further limit um, access to citizenship by refugees and asylum seekers. Um, before, it used to just be a natural progression uh, within a time frame of between 15 and 20 years. Now they are delinking completely time spent in the country and citizenship. And they actually are tying it to either being able to invest heavily in the country or having special skills. So in addition to fleeing persecution, you need to find a pot of gold somewhere and invest in the country. Otherwise, you'll remain a refugee or an asylum seeker permanently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mugobi, for this comprehensive uh, overview. And uh, as one remark on the last, uh, on your last uh, sentence about uh, the requirements for uh, for naturalization, um, as as Victor will uh, will elaborate more uh, during his presentation, the moment when the time uh, when the length of uh, required length of residency starts counting has been a controversial issue also in other uh, countries. Uh, including in Kenya, uh, where so we have the case we have cases like uh, in Uganda where uh, there is a legal path to naturalization uh, for uh, non-refugees, but uh, there are legal ambiguities as to whether or not naturalization is possible for refugees. Then we have cases uh, like uh, South Africa and Kenya where there is a legal path to naturalization again for non-refugees. But when it comes to refugees, there is a big question mark as to when exactly and if uh, the time uh, starts counting uh, for the fulfillment of the residency requirements. And now uh, we, we turn to our last uh, uh, panelist, uh, Victor Niamori. Uh, Victor is a refugee officer for Amnesty International in Kenya and has uh, peer-reviewed the Kenyan case study and provided uh, feedback throughout its development. <coughs> Thank you very much. My name is Nyamori Victor. I work with Amnesty International. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. And our office in Kenya covers the region, especially the East Africa, the central part of it, especially the Great Lakes and the Horn of Africa. So briefly on this topic today, political participation of refugees. And I'll specifically dwell on the Somali refugees and the South Sudanese refugees in Kenya. 
Uh, I can finish this presentation in two minutes uh, by answering the questions, uh, the following questions, no, uh, but uh, maybe we can go deeper and understand what the historical view about it. Do refugees have political participation in Kenya? No. Do they have a right to citizenship in Kenya? No. Do they have a right to organize in Kenya with freedom, access to other things? Yes, but a bit limited. <laughs> Uh, so, in short, that summarizes the situation. But if you look at it deeply in terms of the Kenyan situation, and specifically I will look at the Somali refugee situation. I mean, you, you might be all aware, I mean, the Somali refugee situation has been in Kenya for quite some time. People look at it for over 25 years, but the first wave of refugees started in the 90s into Kenya. Currently, we are talking of over 276,000 uh, Somali refugees in Kenya. But then, some years back, in 2010-2011, the population shot to over 400,000 Somali refugees in Kenya. This was because of the Horn of Africa uh, drought. Uh, in, in, and these refugees are mostly located in the northeastern side of Kenya, which is, there is a location known as the Dab Refugee Camp. And that camp mostly started many years back and has been there for quite some time. It's a big enterprise and it continues being there. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the western side of the country, the other biggest population that we host are the South Sudanese refugees. Uh, we've had a wave of South Sudanese refugees in Kenya for quite some time also. The first, during the first time when the conflict started and when they went back during the voluntary repatriation process, but then also another wave of the people that arrived in Kenya after the recent conflict in South Sudan. So currently we are hosting about 113,000 South Sudanese in Kenya. Overall, in total, all the refugees uh, that we host in Kenya, we are looking at over about 480,000 refugees mm -hmm. in Kenya, compared to what Uganda is hosting. Uh, quite a minimal number. But over a period of time, our population has grown and reduced over time. In 2010-2011, in this region, Kenya was the largest hosting refugees in the country uh, in the region. Uh, the current thing is, uh, in, in, in terms of in the context, the Somali refugees have faced a number of challenges in the country for quite some time. And this is because of the securitization of the refugee situation in Kenya. And basically, the issue of Al Shabaab and terrorism. The Kenyan government uh, have designed modalities of trying to limit rights of refugees in Kenya by not giving them opportunities and space. But this, I mean that if you look at the history uh, very well, with the rise of uh, security related incidents in the region, and specifically Kenya. The government started tightening up the space for refugees and making it more difficult, specifically for the Somali refugees, to access asylum. And uh, a number of terrorist-related activities happened in Kenya. And so in response uh, to this, the government once started arresting and detaining refugees, Somali refugees specifically and procedurally, and also sending them uh, and deporting them outside the country. But then also, on the other side, the Somalia, the South Sudanese refugees who have been there for who have been also been there for quite some time, who are hosted around Kakuma. One of the areas that we also try to look at, the numbers are quite large. Kakuma refugee camp is quite a small town, but if you look at the number that are being hosted there, especially the South Sudanese, quite a large number of, of refugees. The Kenyan government currently is trying to identify something known as the settlement program by starting a new camp, uh, a new settlement uh, known as the Kalope. But there are discussions whether these are really a settlement or a refugee camp, considering the numbers and the opportunities that refugees that are having. In terms of access to rights, refugees don't have voting rights in Kenya. They don't vote, they can't influence, and they can't form anything. Uh, this is because our national legislation requires that people who have rights to vote as citizens 
and refugees do not have access to cities. And this has been a debate for quite some time, like I've been mentioned before with Lina, in terms of what, how do people acquire citizenship. It's quite a big debate uh, in Kenya right now because one, there are issues that are claimed that a number of people acquire citizenship fraudulently by beating the system and accessing citizenship documents fraudulently from the government. There's also an issue within the northern Kenya where most Somali refugees are hosted. It is worth uh, in the last census, it came to the attention of the government that the population had multiplied three times compared to any other population in the, in the region. The last census for that northern side of Kenya where Dadaab, Garissa, and all the other where Somalis are, were not released publicly because the government was short of the population. The discussion here was, are these citizenship? Are these, are these citizens or are these Somali refugees who, are, who acquired citizenship in Kenya? It's quite a big debate also, but we have seen in the recent paper in Kenya where it is said that the population of Somali is quite a big number, and so we should be able to praise ourselves by accepting the fact that their numbers will be high, regardless of the fact that there are some refugees who are hosted there. I'll give you an example in terms of access to proper documentation. The refugees still have challenges on this. Uh, in Kenya, I, I, I tried hosting an event that included working with refugees. And uh, one of the things included bringing refugees from the refugee camp and uh, I mean, putting them in a hotel in, in Nairobi and other places. Uh, when I presented the refugees to be able to move them to a hotel, I mean, the hotel refused. They could not be able to take in documentation from the refugees. And so I had to use my national ID to book them in into the hotel. So these are the challenges in terms of access to documentation, recognition of documentation that refugees have. But unfortunately, the banks are now realizing the rights of, of, of this. Uh, they are realizing there is business in the refugee sector. So they are allowing refugees to re use their documentation to register for mobile services and phone uh, bank, bank accounts and all that. In terms of access to civil society, do refugees have access to this? Uh, I mean, when I come to Uganda, I'm always very surprised and very encouraged by the kind of situation, the kind of very active civil society and refugee relations. You can hear that you can hear a refugee organized in the community somewhere in the village somewhere, but not outrightly as it is in Kenya. I don't know why. Maybe something that uh, worth looking out for. But historically, Kenya is known to deporting people who engage in issues that does not touch well on the state. Two people, South Sudanese, uh, abducted in Nairobi were deported. Claims are that they were returned back to their country because they made comments that the Kenyan government was not happy with uh, in social media and they engaged in politics that they felt uh, the government felt was not happy. A human rights lawyer was also, South Sudanese actually, a human rights lawyer was also picked up in, uh, in the Nairobi and also deported back. Uh, we still don't know the whereabouts, but there are indications that this person was deported back. So those are challenges that civil society and all these other organizations have in, in accessing the, the rights. But interestingly also, um, we have an encampment policy. With all this kind of discussion we have, because of the security, the lack of interest, limiting the rights of refugee, the government is pushing, pushing for encampment policy uh, illegally, still debatable in court and uh, refugee organizations like uh, national refugee organizations, not refugee-led organizations, are challenging this process in court. Refugees are not allowed to move freely, and you can imagine, obviously, if you don't move freely, your access to other rights get limited. And you cannot come to such kind of conference where you are found outside there, you'll be asked for which kind of documentation do you have. 
if you don't have proper explanation, you'll be put up in jail. And if you don't have uh, a good amount of money to pay, you'll wait for up to the time when you are charged of this. So these are normal situations in Kenya. And lack of movement, lack of freedom of movement, make refugees not be able to exercise their rights to access to other things. But also, uh, one thing that now it is coming up strongly, refugee leadership. There is informal leadership in the camp where we have refugee leaders, the specific zone leaders, uh, then thematic leaders, people who deal with wash, people deal, who deal with food distribution, there are specific leadership within that. But then also there is the overall leadership in the camp, camp leadership. But there are discussions that have come up that these people are always selected on specifically on uh, to advance one, the government interest and also other international organization interests and don't independently speak about issues that affect refugees. I'll give you an example. When the DAP was, government gave an order for the closure of the DAP. Uh, most of the time, when donors get into the camp just to hear about refugee situation, the, the, you will hear refugee saying, I mean, the interest to go back home is quite good and all this kind of, and so they all were willing to support and marshal all these other colleagues, members to be able to get back to Somalia. But when Amnesty International approached the camp and also talked to the leadership, we selected a number of leadership. We asked the community to give us uh, quite a number of leadership to be able to, uh, to speak to donors about their situation. And we brought them back all the way to Nairobi and gave them a round table, closed door discussion like this. And the discussion was totally different from what some of the donors will always be receiving when they go to the camp. So it tells you that even if the leadership are there, it's always misconceived and mis uh, way of how to express challenges and issues that are affecting on refugees. But then also, there is active uh, political activities in the camps and the situation in, 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 in the camps in Kenya. Most of this leadership in uh, the current Somali government, some of them came from Dadaa. And so that has been an encouragement to some of the refugee leaders and also people in the camp just to be able to try and uh, uh, participate on issues that are affecting them back at home. Yesterday I was speaking to one of the colleagues here also, um, a South Sudanese, who mentioned that Kenya played a big role in, this, uh, in, the, in, the, in the peace agreement some time back, like uh, places like Naivasha, Machakos, all those. So in one way or the other, the political government influenced how the political government in the host country influenced how political situations happen in countries where refugees are. And that has been a, a situation, example, on the, so on the South Sudanese refugees. I'll briefly stop there, and I'll be happy to share and answer more questions when we discuss further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. And uh, that was a very, a very good and interesting point that uh, host and origin countries do not exist in a vacuum. They very often interrelate, in, they interact, and there is a, a big impact uh, on the origin country, uh, of the policies of the host country, and vice versa. We will now open the floor for questions, and um, I would like to ask Andy to circulate the microphone. Um, just to say for those of you who uh, came before, after my announcement, um, this event is being, as you can see, recorded and um, we hope live streamed. Um, so uh, just just for your own individual uh, situation, please bear that in mind um, that it is going out live um, and being recorded for future use as well. I just wanted to make sure that everybody was fully aware of that so that they can uh, pose their questions accordingly. So uh, let's take the first round of questions. Um, yes, over there. I see two hands. Please identify yourself. And one more hand here. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, the presenters. Uh, I'm called Amanya Joseph. I'm a South Sudanese refugee. For the second time, I just would like to make a quick observation. In all your presentations, it's like most of the government, the host country government, are playing a role of blocking refugees from actually getting engaged into politics, either of their country of origin or the country that is hosting them. I didn't clearly understand, maybe it could be another subject of research, why should they feel so much insecure about refugees getting involved into politics, yet the situation that has forced refugees to come to their country is actually itself a political situation. So it keeps me wonder as to why. I've lived in Uganda here for quite a long period of time, and I must appreciate the transitioning that the Uganda government is uh, undergoing through issues of refugees. The refugees are being in the 90s. It's not the same refugee now I'm seeing that the South Sudanese refugees are undergoing. It could be a different situation in Nakivale. But the situation of South Sudanese refugees, it could also be different because they have these cross-border tribes which are directly related to them. So maybe it is because of these intertribal linkages. That's why the situation of refugees is different. So it is making me confused as to why exactly this is happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another question in the back. Thank you so much. My name is Akuriloshi Musikami Bekos. I'm a, a refugee human rights defender. I'd like to have done just briefly three comments. One is in the presentations, I haven't seen actually a, an argument where we are thinking about the policies, much as we say the gaps in the terms of policies. But I haven't seen whether a, a way forward in terms of addressing these policies. Both, if you look at the UN Convention 19, 1951, it's also too limiting refugees in their political um, uh, spheres. The refugee, the Uganda refugee policy is the same. The second, um, my second uh, comment is that um, I'm wondering about the, the the whole topic in terms of uh, in terms of politics in itself and engagement is more of of available services which can encourage people to be more involved in this. Um, and if you look at the, the situation, the responses from either the international organizations or local leaders' organizations around, they are not this kind of um, a phenomena where you find that they are encouraging services which can drive people to understand better the situation and to be involved in much in political activities. And my last comment is that exactly, in the Uganda context, I'd like to be much enlightened to understand better what do they define as politics. Because this has been one among the issues we are, we are, we are grappling with as refugee leaders, whether a civic engagement, whether asking for accountability, whether saying that I can mobilize my, my fellow people, either refugees or host communities the way I live, for a rally, for a better service as a political, as a political activity. And these are some of the, the key issues I'd like to, to understand from this research, if it covered them up. Thanks so much. Thank you. And we have one more question here in the front. And thank you so much. Um, Ter Manya, I work with Internet Youth for Africa. Uh, for those who did not see me yesterday, we were here yesterday. Uh, I'm a refugee for the first time. I was pushed in my country, uh, which I don't want to be a refugee. Um, I have a lot of questions. Uh, I started from my sister from South Africa. Uh, as you stated about the case study of Congolese in South Africa, um, I'm wondering, apart from, uh, is there any other services to provide to Congolese who are living in South Africa? Because now, uh, uh, in, uh, according to your presentation, you said that uh, they have a camp which uh, they cannot access to come to urban. Uh, I don't know whether the government of South Africa allow the Congolese uh, to have a citizenship. Uh, 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 that is a question. And another question goes to my uh, and his brother, uh, Victor, who is working with Hamnas International. We have been advocating for the issue of concern about the region. Uh, in Kenya as a country, 
is a part of international treaties about uh, 1951 uh, refugee convention and also is uh, inside other treaties. I'm wondering whether Kenya follow the international law and international human rights uh, law plus inter, uh, international humanitarian law. Because now it will be meaningless uh, for the country to be uh, a member of the United Nations and which uh, they don't implement uh, those and such of human rights in the United Nations. Um, about the case study of Uganda, yes, uh, when you look at the country of Uganda, uh, we can say that yes, there are some services and provide to South Sudan refugees, maybe in other refugees in Uganda, there's a, and there's a freedom of movement, you can, you can go anywhere you want, you can do your business, and which is the good uh, part, we need to appreciate the government of Uganda for that. So uh, when you look at the issue of the work, I don't know whether the South Sudanese refugees, maybe any uh, other refugees can allow to work in the public institution. For instance, I was in Uganda for 10 years when I was looking for internship. Uh, I was told you cannot get internship in government institution because you are a foreigner. When I was looking for internship in KCCA, Kampala Capital City Authority. Uh, because now these are the issues we've been raised. But now we need to involve other lawmakers when, as we discussed yesterday here in the room, in order to understand and, and what is going on in the region. Victor, I don't know whether Amnesty International provide the services to the refugees who are maybe the victim of rape, uh, maybe the killing uh, and the treasuring. Uh, so we are aware of what is going on in Kenya. I was in Kakumba refugee last year to make an assessment on the gender-based violence I seen. What uh, I, I saw there, uh, even, and the good thing, you are honest. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for all the interesting questions. Um, maybe we can start with Tigrana, and then we go to a second round of questions. We can start with Tigrana, then Mukondi, and then Victor. Thank you. So I think I'll um, tackle two of the questions, just because I, I find them to be fairly interrelated. Why should host countries be threatened by refugees getting involved in political situations and or political dynamics of their origin countries, if I understood you correctly. And that goes to your question, um, what do Ugandans or the Ugandan policies define as politics or to be political? So to answer the first question, um, not to become completely controversial or dive deep into this topic, anything specific to forced migration uh, in the Great Lakes region and Uganda being at the epicenter of that is political in terms of the geopolitical dynamics, meaning what's happening in South Sudan, in Congo, Somalia, doesn't operate in a vacuum. It's not exclusive to Somali politics or political dynamics or South Sudanese politics or Congolese politics. It's all intertwined with, with one another and uh, there is an element of, of involvement in, in, in the region in terms of neighboring countries um, dappling into each other's politics. So in terms of refugee protection, that is, that's where the boundary has to be drawn in the sense of you've become a refugee and now it's, it's as I had said, you shouldn't be talking about the dynamics which led you to be a refugee because you have been granted safety and asylum and anything further than that is going to directly challenge and dive deep into, well, what are the realities that actually drove me to be a refugee? So, and that's where things become quite complicated and challenge the status quo upon which refugees are, are mandated, the international protection that they receive. Um, I think I, I won't really go further into that, but I, uh, I think you understand where, where I'm going with it. In terms of um, what do Ugandans define as politics? So that's a very complex question, but I think uh, that could be anything from direct political involvement into the Ugandan political dynamics, as well as refugees being involved in advocating for the political processes of whether it's DRC, South Sudan, and actually being vocal about what is happening in that country. And, uh, but to having it move broader than a one-on-one -on -one conversation where actually communities are being mobilized and there is mass 
organization in that way. But also, it's the reality is that refugees are put into a box where they are recipients of humanitarian aid, and a lot of times decisions are made on their behalf. And uh, that's not something that is necessarily fair, fair, but that's the reality. And so it's, it's not very clear where the line is drawn because a lot of times refugees become stigmatized when they want to be involved in the decision-making processes of humanitarian service delivery, development initiatives, and the organizations working on their behalf. Here in Uganda, I, mean, I would agree with Victor in the fact that refugee-led civil society is very strong, and there are a lot of refugee-led initiatives that have been born out of the need to respond to the gaps they're seeing in the services that are provided to them. And arguably, they can probably work as, as efficient, if not better, than many of the organizations working on their behalf, not to, discur not to discredit anyone, but just to bring into the context of the fact that they, many times, decisions are made for refugees, on behalf of refugees, but not by refugees for themselves. And that's where they become stigmatized in the fact that they don't have access to the same resources, to the same access to donors, and all of those things, because you know that's where we get into the politics of, oh, well, there isn't accountability, or we need more capacity building, and all of these things where that's not necessarily true, because I don't want to be making a decision without properly consult, consulting refugees and working on their behalf. It should be an, in, an inclusive dialogue. But sometimes when you push on those boundaries, it also becomes political. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, Pecos, but I think it's a, it's a long-winded uh, reality. So thank you. Thank you, Tigrana. Um, Gondi? Thank you, Helena. Um, the first question, um, I will link it directly to my case study. Um, so why is South Africa blocking political participation of Congolese in the DRC? Um, well, besides national interest, um, there's also, which I mentioned <coughs> in my brief presentation, the issue of business linkages, corruption, and political patronage. Um, the ANC government and individuals within that government have got a direct interest, financial interest, in instability in the DRC. So it does not make good financial sense for South Africa to take a decisive stance um, against the Kabila regime. Those are facts. Kill me. Um, um, sorry, I let go. I lost my diplomacy. It's back now. Um, in terms of uh, policy reforms, what are we suggesting or recommending as policy changes? Um, in all honesty, I think that the policy frameworks to a large extent are there. It's about implementation and politicization of how the, 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 the implementation of policy is done. We also need to bear in mind that refugee status um, is supposed to be a temporary thing to start with, right? So is, does it really make a lot of sense for us to create permanent frameworks um, for something that we should be um, breaking down in terms of how long it has lasted for. It, we cannot um, legitimize the fact that people remain in limbo for 20, 30, 40 years. And that is what we need to tackle. So how, how do we as a collective contribute to building stability and putting pressure um, on the regimes that force people out of their countries? This is what we need to address rather than trying to create mechanisms to accommodate this bad behavior, which, which is what we are discussing now. Um, so what are the durable solutions and what are we doing to facilitate and, and impose them? I think that is probably where we need to go in terms of policy direction. Um, and this has to do a lot with um, elections, um, practice and application of democracy in our different countries. It is wrong that we send big delegations of election observation missions from all over the world who come and describe rigged elections as free, fair, and credible. It's just wrong. Um, this is where we, it has to start. Um, so I think we all have to take a collective responsibility um, and, and really look at how we contribute to perpetuating the problem. Um, the third question around the extension of services in South Africa. South Africa doesn't have an encampment policy, my brother. Um, maybe I, 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 I confused you because I referred to the system in Botswana. 
South Africa, when you arrive, they give you a short-term permit. You can work, you can study, you basically sort yourself out. They offer no services besides the documentation. Once you have been given a refugee status, they give you a refugee document that um, is basically a migration permit for two years which can be extended that you can use to open a bank account, find a job and so forth. Um, the government is also supposed to issue you with a travel document. The only <coughs> challenge is legally you are required to come with a letter from your embassy stating that they cannot give you a travel document as their national and that is the basis upon which South Africa gives you um, the international travel document, which is really bizarre given that uh, you are risking your life going to get that letter in the first place. But that is the law. So those are some of the policy reforms or legal reforms that we need to look at. Um, but I think we, 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 we really, really have to look at, start looking at refugees and asylum seekers as people before anything else and as our equals in our societies. And that will help us also address um, questions around their status um, in a more compassionate and, and, and sustainable manner. Thank you. Yes, uh, I like the point you mentioned about the election being free and fair. Uh, we had the same situation in Kenya. But anyway, uh, I'll start uh, one, one question that was posed on Kenya is a signatory of all these international uh, treaties, human rights uh, standards and principle, but is, is, is the question is, is it implementing it? It will still depend on which side of the plate you want to stand from. If you hear the Attorney General give a presentation of what Kenya has done in terms of progressive human rights standards uh, internationally in all these international conference, you'll, you'll want to come to Kenya because it will be a glossy kind of a very nice kind of a situation. But sitting on a human rights organization point of view, we totally have a different picture because all these standards, as much as they are there, they are just lofty aspirations in terms of paperwork, in terms of just aspiration that the government signs to. The same situation when we look at the voluntary repatriation process in Kenya, um, of the Somalis. Uh, uh, from the position I stand with, it's not a a voluntary process to return back to Somalia because the decision being made is not well informed uh, and the Somalis don't have options uh, in terms of choosing whether to stay or just to go. And the circumstances are pushing them to leave. But these are well protected in the international standards. Uh, but then from the government side and from other international organizations side, Things are fine. There is a voluntary process, and people are just going back home. So it all depends on which side that you want to stand with. Uh, then there was a, also a discussion on the way forward. Uh, for uh, for us in Kenya, it, mostly for uh, on this political engagement of, of refugees, uh, uh, and I'm looking at, at political not on the capital P, but on the political small p, uh, where I think the, the role of county government, uh, that uh, in county government in Kenya we mean local government, uh, coming out very strongly. Because they have realized where refugees are, especially Kakuma refugee camp, Dadaab refugee camp, that is, the, that is the cornerstone of business and that is the, where they get most of their resources in terms of tax. Uh, taxing lo uh, local business and resources. So local government have started engaging in planning and all this kind of process in, 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 this, in, in, in these places where the camps are. But then this should be graduated to the effect that now refugees also have an opportunity to also to engage and question the local government on policies and issues that affect them. Uh, uh, no, this one was handled very well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor and Mukondi. We are already overdue, uh, but uh, we will take uh, three last questions before the coffee break. Thank you so much. My name is Sengaliwali. I'm a refugee from DRC. <clears throat> First of all, uh, 
thank you so much for this discussion. Um, comparing to, to Kenya, uh, refugee situation, I have to congratulate again, once again, the government of Uganda. Uh, they are not doing 100%, but they are trying their little best. Because here, you can go do business. As we know, but in Kenya, the way I see our people, they are suffering there. So, I'm going to my sound comment. First of all, uh, my sister from South, South Africa. Thank you for being very open. You know that South Africa, some key individuals that they have input in the Congolese crisis, and good enough, you have mentioned it. So, um, I'm trying to ask, now Mr. Zuma is out, and he was a, the key player. Can we, our people there, can they expect a new reform of the new president? The second one, uh, <clears throat> amnesty. I think you are witnessing things in Kenya. What's the concrete input of the amnesty to this situation of refugee in Kenya? Are you quiet? Because maybe the government is very heavy on you, or you are trying to push something, and how are you pushing? And then, <clears throat> Uh, I want also to come, uh, because as Mr. Pekos asked and uh, Chikana trying to explain the first kind of politics, in my understanding, this politics is, we are not allowed to participate in Ugandan politics, it cannot be with this country, with Uganda, Kenya, and other housing countries. Why this country can also, can they empower refugees to participate in their own politics? The point of our country of origin. If we are not allowed to participate in Ugandan politics, why not we can't participate in our own politics? Because being a refugee, we still have our rights. Then, I don't know, maybe this one will be the last one. <laughs> <laughs> the last one is, uh, Madam, you're trying to bring the presentation, but I didn't hear where you are trying to think about the. Because we are refugees here, and we were not born refugees. Somewhere, maybe well grown, that we forced to be refugees. Why don't you think about these gaps, the origin of being refugees? When I thought to think about the origin, this is the poor leaderships in the, in our country of origin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman in the front, and then uh, two more questions here, but please stay very brief. <coughs> Thank you very much. I recognize the presence of everybody in the house. And by name, John Machek, a South Sudanese. Uh, I'm going to highlight some of the things and then I go straight to my question. At the, when you look at the international system, there are five major issues that are affecting one country to another country. One of them is climate change. The second one is an economic crisis. The third one are uh, civil wars at the cause root of the what? The refugees. And of course, refugees crisis. And then terror attacks, which is also another cause of refugees crisis. Now, these things affect one country to another country because we have seen so many civil wars. In Syria, it is damaged. Libya, it is also a problem. South Sudan, the country where I came from, is also in crisis. Somalia and the rest of the countries, they are in deep crisis. Of so, the political participation, political participation of the refugees, whatever we do, the government, or let me say the leadership, remain the key player. Whatever we do in a given country, the leadership remain a key player. And we cannot avoid politics. Even at the family level, there's politics. So my question is, if we don't allow refugees into politics. 
how can we get things that are affecting them? Things that affect them. How can we get apart from the ac academic academicians who can go to the refugees camp, carry out the site, and then they come with it is not adequately right. But when we interact with them, I think we can be able to get things that are even solutions. But if we don't involve them, how are we going to solve the problems, the national problems, the local problems, and even at the international problems? So that's the question. If we don't involve the disadvantaged group, how are we going to get things that are affecting them, and how are we going to get the solution to solve the problem? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your observations. Uh, one more question, the gentleman here. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Leonard Hobbs and Kenya. I am a Ugandan by birth and I am a Ugandan by nationality. I have 40 years in Uganda. I am still a wanderer. Uh, I am a human, refugee human rights defender in Uganda with a lot of experience in refugee life. Uh, my question, I would like to ask the organizers, uh, are you aware that the Rwanda refugees in Uganda are facing a very dangerous problem of killing and kidnapping by Rwanda government, supported by a small group which is very powerful because Rwanda government is is fueling them, is financing them to hunt poor people who are fighting daily bread to buy just one kilo of sugar and one kilo of potatoes. Are you aware of that problem? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And the last question, uh, the gentleman over there. And unfortunately, this will be the last one. Bonjour. Bonjour. Good morning. It's not because I don't speak English. <laughs> because it's my comrade. It's my, my revolution. It's my resistance. The uh, reason for which I want to speak French. My name Mango Alex. Je suis réfugié congolais. My name is Mango Alex. I am a Congolese refugee. Je suis le fondateur d'une organisation en équivalent de Settlement, Wakati Foundation. I am the founder of an organization in Akivale Settlement, Wakati Foundation. J'ai une question que je vais poser. S'il n'y avait pas la guerre, s'il n'y avait pas des réfugiés, la Nations Unies pourrait être travail. I have a question to pose. Uh, if there were no wars and if there were no refugees, what would be the role of the United Nations? Nous parlons des États. Nous parlons des respect des conventions. We are talking about states and we are talking about the respect uh, for um, conventions. Ces États n'ont-elles pas signé des traités avec la Nations Unies? Haven't these uh, countries signed treaties uh, of the United Nations? Merci. Thank you. Okay, uh, I will uh, kindly ask the uh, panelists to give a very brief uh, response. Unfortunately, we are uh, overdue, uh, but I hope that we can continue the discussion during the short uh, coffee break that will follow. Uh, so let's go to a very, very short round of responses, uh, Tigrana. So I think, I, I think this is a conversation um, th that is ongoing in terms of um, the origin of being a refugee. And of course, refugees are civilians. Before they were refugees, they were nationals 
of a country. They were civilians and they have crossed an international border for reasons oftentimes beyond their control and for political reasons. And that is something we can't divorce ourselves of, of that reality. So if you have crossed an international border and you become a refugee for a political reason, of course that, re that, re that, re that requires a political solution. And everyone should be empowered to engage in a political process in order to take destiny and ownership of why you have become a refugee, why you have been forced into exile, why you have left your country, and take ownership of the, of the platforms that exist in order for you to go back to your country of origin. And now in the Great Lakes region, both historically and arguably currently, we're growing up with generations of young people who are seeing the only way there can be a transition of power is through force not through democratic processes or platforms. And I would really encourage, to, to stay brief, I would really encourage a lot of the service providers, whether it's humanitarian development initiatives that any of us are a part of, is really incorporate leadership training skills for young people into your programs. Because as much as a lot of the development initiatives I've seen in terms of basket weaving and soap making and cultural dance and all that is great, but we need strong leaders to be groomed while they are in exile so they can go back to their countries of origin and prevent other people from their countries to become refugees. Absolutely. I would I would I would agree with that that reality. So let's continue that conversation during the coffee break. Thank you very much, Tigrana. Um Kobe, one last comment. Um, I think to sum up all the questions that were asked in this um, in this second round. Um, I just have one statement to make. War is an expensive exercise, but it's also a very lucrative business. <laughs> that is still thinking here. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> one question was in terms of what is Amnesty doing? Uh, much is going on in Kenya. But two examples. One, we were part of the organization that challenged the social of the Adam refugee camp. Another example, we, we currently work with selected kind of refugee uh, persons to train them on advocacy and campaign skills so they can be able to be part, uh, part and parcel of change. Thank you all very much and many thanks to the audience for listening so patiently and for posing uh, these very interesting and valid and provocative questions. I hope we can continue the discussion uh, off camera for the next 20 minutes and we will resume at uh, 20 to 12 for the second session. Thank you very much. Um, with regards to their origin countries. Um, we'll take the four presentations, similar format, we'll take the four presentations and then we'll go to questions and answers. I'm just going to go through uh, the list uh, as, as it is on the agenda. So I'm um, handing over to Simon to start. Uh, thank you so much. Good morning, more <laughs> Good morning. Me, I'm just going to leave the and uh, I'm going to give you my perspective on political participation of refugees here in Uganda, where they are being hosted and back home in their countries of origin. Uh, I will pick up from where the care of the hotel, South Africa, left. She gave a very serious point and said, War is bad. And it's not dependent on the very much So it's up to the refugees to either stop the war or participate fully in ending this business. Or else they should not, they will be part of what the business. So why do I say that? Uh, political participation is very good. It's a very good thing and a very good idea for the refugees. Because these are the people that are facing all these atrocities, all these political miscalculations in their countries of origin. So if they are given any space to make sure that uh, they at least contribute in bettering where they come from or where they are right now, I think they can easily give back to uh, the whole of humanity. <coughs> why do I say so? Uh, when I came in the year 2000, I was just eight years old. I didn't know why we were living. Uh, what I used to know is that we are used to fight in our area. 
but I didn't know that it's something that can force me out of my place of origin honor. So when I reached in university with this settlement, I settled with my brothers. After one year, they went back. So I had men as an accompanied minor. So after growing in Uganda and seeing all this transition from a fairly restricted uh, setting in the 2000 to at least the flexible uh, Uganda currently, I believe Uganda refugees have a bigger hand. They have like some opportunity to participate either non-formally or at least formally. Why do I say non-formally? Non-formally because the environment here in Uganda, people can see, look at it as something which is very clear. But uh, there is no revolutionary that can, can allow revolutionary ideas to be passed for the next generation in, in, their, own, in their country. Why do I say so? The, the, the person who is in power right now came through the support of refugees who were in Tanzania by then. So, NRM was supported by refugees in Tanzania. That's when they came to power. So do we think the same NRM government can allow refugees to participate openly in what may be changing or in bettering the, the situations of their country back home? The second thing is the issue of trust. Like refugees here in Uganda have so much blame. They are saying there is a perception that Uganda is so much contributing so much into their being here in Uganda. The South Sudan will just tell you that the same is the one ruling our country. We will not have like, uh, a governor who is that side. The Congolese will tell you Museum is so much contributing to uh, supporting the DRC stability. So how true are you that the refugees here can be flexible, can be like breathing, to say that yes, we have to participate when they know that the environment here is not going to be For example, in 2016 last year, South Sudan here were leading. They were saying no, since Uganda is participating fully in this war, it's not better for you to be a refugee in Uganda when you're in South Sudan. Most people the Nuer and uh, the, the people of the Nuer uh, ethnic origin. They say the Uganda is not going to be safe for them because the is supporting the government. So they were running away to Kenya, others were running away to, to Ethiopia. So according to me, political participation of this can be something very important. Because one, if you take these young people who are in the camps there, which are predominantly young people and women, that Politics is something that you cannot avoid because even the prices of your salt is determined by the political line, uh, the political decisions that are taken in parliament and in the head of what, the head of the country. So if these young people are not taught their cultures, if they are not taught uh, the political instability, like the things that happen, the history of South Sudan, where will they end? I started here in Uganda. I'm a Ugandan by education. I started here in Uganda, but I don't know the politics of South Sudan. I even don't know who the Arabs who, who were ruling us. So if I'm not taught in my in the refugee settlement there, where will I end? But the, the question is, is there a possibility of me even being again here in Uganda? When political education was removed as a subject from all level in the year 2009, I was forced to, to register a subject in the final year. They said, no, Museven has said political education has to be removed because they are, uh, it is grooming political uh, actors in the country. So I was supposed to go and register for agriculture in the final year because political education was avoided. So how possible is it here in Uganda? According to me as a refugee, I love it. And in, in case there is any, any, any chance, should there be any election in South Sudan, I will even go back and forth. Thank you so much. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'll pass on now to uh, Jerry, who is a Congolese refugee here in Uganda. Miss um, Andrew, thank you very much. Um, well, um, with um, my colleague Simon, he is uh, my fellow refugee here on the panel, in a uh, truthless telling, because um, we actually face the same challenges. Uh, my name is um, Lukendo Mokani Bara. Um, I am a refugee from DRC. I've been in Uganda for the last 10 years. Um, I am a co-founder and um, director of program of uh, One New Fun Heart Initiative. Uh, well, um, when we look at uh, the, the policy that has been um, uh, designed here in Uganda, where refugees, uh, I mean asylum seekers, are given um, support and conditional support on entry 
as they come to Uganda. Um, it is really great because somebody who is in fear and maybe running persecution and then is given a salam sick unconditionally. That is really great and that is something to, 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 to praise. Um, but the question into Uganda and is, it, is within Uganda. Some of them flee when they are uh, singles, others came uh, with their uh, uh, siblings and children. And then they end up spending like um, 10 to 25 years in this country. Um, uh, children that are born here uh, are not given space, you know, to, 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 to have, uh, um, like to be given uh, citizenship here in Uganda simply because there are restrictions in their laws um, that the refugee cannot be given a citizenship at birth. Uh, which I think Mr. Innocent with us here will maybe elaborate more on that. Um, all this uh, makes refugee to be more vulnerable when it comes to political participation. Because once you keep on holding the refugee status for a long time, uh, you will be unable to participate in, uh, formally in the politics. Um, I will not repeat the, the, the mystic grana of uh, underlined the, the, the Refugee Act, how it says. I'm sure everybody has heard what it says. Um, yeah, it gives refugee opportunities to engage in uh, community activities, in association. Uh, but the social, so of course, they have to tackle um, uh, social challenges. And this has given us an opportunity to come up with initiatives. Um, as uh, Congolese refugees in Uganda, we have very many initiatives that we have come up with. And what we do in this initiative is to train young people in entrepreneurship um, using a bottom-up approach, whereby um, they are given an opportunity to think out of the box. They're given an opportunity to, to come up with the solutions towards uh, the challenges that they face in their community. And this we are trying to bridge the gap between both uh, refugees and house community youth because we, we normally include uh, both of them. Uh, this is just um, an example of uh, my organization because that's the work we do. But we have very many other initiatives um, that refugees have come up with, some on skills and language uh, trainings. Others are doing uh, human rights uh, activities. Um, that is really great. Um, I think when I go back again to this article, uh, the, the 29th uh, G the, of uh, Refugee Act, you will find out that there is a lot of confusion because this is already politics. President Kagame once said, once you engage yourself in community development work, you're actually doing politics. And uh, I think we are allowed much as is into bracket, not formally, and maybe there are things that, um, yes, we cannot do. But I would, I would really encourage that this initiative that has already been taken to be um, to be really put into practices, so that because there is a lot that refugee can contribute um, when it comes to peaceful coexistence in their country of of, of origin. Uh, maybe um, I would uh, conclude by saying that um, to refugees, um, politics it is not. Uh, taking guns and, you know, try to kill each other. But to us refugees, politics, it is good governance. It is um, defending for the rights of, uh, of, of, of people. It is um, the community development work that every single individual of us uh, is doing. It is demanding for um, accountability. It is demanding to be given what belongs, what belongs to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Um, 
So I think, you know, uh, throughout today, this sort of conversation of what politics actually means and, you know, is, is, is coming through constantly. And I think, you know, this is, this is part of the problems because it means something different to every single person. Um, you know, there are probably many of you in the room who, who would not consider community development as politics, but obviously Kagame does. Um, and I think this is, this is where it's really sort of uh, important. And then thank you to both of you guys for presenting the sort of complexity of the refugee situation here in Uganda as well which feeds into that because uh, we have refugees here who and, and, and in the room who have been refugees multiple times who have returned to their countries of origin and then have been further displaced um, again due to conflict for the most part and their experiences are so very different um, you know Simon was educated here he's, he's had, had a, a Ugandan education other people are educated in their home country and even within that dynamic each person has a different interpretation of what political means with, a, with the small p um, and you know then when you come and how long you stay also will impact on that if you come as a young child and go home as a as a young adult you may not be so engaged if you come as a young child stay through to becoming a parent and a, an and an, an, old, an, an adult you may want to get involved and if you have children here or if you you know this is where the the uh, refugee situation in Uganda is so very complex because we're not talking about people who unfortunately we're not talking about people who come for two years and then go home. Um, so with that sort of all in mind, with the complexities that we are facing here in Uganda and um, with uh, the individual interpretations of p political with uh, a big P, small P, and etc., let me now hand over to our uh, two Ugandan representatives on the panel today. First, um, it's Peter from Chapter 4 Uganda. Thank you so much, and thank you for the clarification I'm a Ugandan citizen, I'm, I'm not a, a refugee, and um, um, the, only, the only major difference possibly from uh, many other uh, Ugandan citizens who might be here is um, I come from a community that has hosted refugees, I think, for the last, um, I don't know, since 50s. First was the Rwandese refugees, and when they left, we had uh, around 10 years. Uh, without refugees, and then we have Congolese refugees. That is in uh, Romanja refugee settlement in uh, Kamwenge district. So my discussion will, uh, from the perspective of a Ugandan who has lived closer to refugees. Uh, I'm also a lawyer, and I've, um, I don't like to call it a chance, but I've interacted with the refugees, including representing some refugees. Some of them have been um, unfortunately deported back to their countries despite the fact that courts in some of those cases had ruled that they have, uh, they, they, they should be staying in the country. So uh, when we talk about uh, political participation, one of the things that come into our mind is that people think of elective politics. So the moment you say political participation of refugees, they think what the person thinks first is elective politics. And that's where I think the, the first hurdle comes. Because before I go into the hurdles that come, is the general treatment of refugees in Uganda has been, um, we have citizens who are a bit like pure and refugees who are less pure. So there are two levels. And uh, it, whether it's government, whether it's an NGO, anyone dealing with refugees, the NGO or government comes in the perspective of, we are helping you. We helped you to get land. We helped you to stay here. So don't ask questions. Yeah. That is the, the kind of, of, of relation we have. So because don't ask questions, don't even interact with citizens because well, not expressed, but you are less than the citizens. So when you say, I want to participate in politics, you are not. And that is, when you look at Uganda's laws, for example, if you look at Uganda's constitution, it creates those rights. They are rights for citizens, and they are not available for non-citizens. If you read through, there is where it says, 
a citizen of Uganda shall have a right to do this. Then there is where it says, any person has a right to do this. So I'll give you an example. Uh, it says, every Ugandan citizen has a right to participate in affairs of government individually or through elective, rep uh, elected representatives. That's Article 38 of the Constitution. Note, it says every citizen of Uganda. So it doesn't mean any other person. It also says every Ugandan has a right to participate in peaceful activities to influence the policies of government through civic organizations. So that is limited to citizens. Then you have other articles like um, the right of access to information. Even court ruled at one time that that right is only available to citizens. Uh, the, the right to a clean and healthy environment. It says every citizen of Uganda shall have a right to a clean and healthy environment. So possibly if you're a non-citizen, you can't claim that right. Now, it creates, from the beginning, we create that. And then we, we move to the fears now. The fears of refugees participating in politics. One, it creates the fear of foreign influence in local decisions. If you've been in Uganda during election time, you'll hear stories where people say, yeah, some Rwandese voted, uh, some uh, citizens of this country were ferried to this place. So there is always that fear. And so that will become a bit difficult to put them. The other one is the fear of antagonizing the neighboring countries. And uh, it's on record that um, uh, the late Rijema and Kagame of Rwanda were refugees in Uganda, and uh, we know what happened. I don't need to, report the, uh, uh, to repeat the history. They formed a group, uh, attacked the country, and now there is a new government, which has been there for 20 or so years in Rwanda. Uh, <clears throat> a few claims of refugees from DRC who also participated in uh, the overthrow of, uh, of um, Mobutu. Yeah. So there is always that fear that we might have these refugees antagonizing the foreign countries as well as our own countries because it's also on record that during the Bush war that brought the NRM government into power, they relied a lot on refugees who were soldiers to fight the Obote government. So if we are talking about refugee participating in politics, that fear has to be overcome and understood. Uh, and that fear also goes into other laws. I've already mentioned about the Constitution. But um, I've, I've seen some laws. For example, the, the new NGO Act, it came into force in 2016. And it makes it quite difficult for a refugee to start an NGO or a CBO in Uganda. And yet, this is a small unit of organization where you can advocate, even if it was to advocate for a clean environment where you are staying, you will need approval from the district, approval from the cow, uh, recommendation from the ministry, the line ministry, then you are able to start. How available, how would a refugee in Rwamwanja, where I come from, access might be the ministry to get a recommendation to start an NGO, it's quite a, a hard task. Same happens to the Cooperative Act when it comes to forming circles where you can save some money and do that. So that becomes a bit difficult. But I had recently engaged this, a funny situation. There are Somali refugees in Kisenyi. Kisenyi is uh, one suburb of Kampala. And these people, because they are Muslims, every evening they would converge somewhere and pray. And police issued them a letter that if they are going to have that association, in police eyes, that was an association, they'll have to register it. And our question were two. Ugandans do not register what they call cells, for the case of Christians, when they are praying. So why should refugees register theirs? Secondly, is there's this freedom of worship. So if we came into this room every evening and prayed, why should we be required to, to register? But that points to the point that there is some fear of the unknown. 
when they go into that room, do they only pray or do they do something beyond prayers? So we need to control it. We need to know what they do to be able to... Yeah, so that's, uh, that's the challenge. Then um, I, I notice these issues when we are dealing with refugees in Uganda. We have a policy that everyone has prized and a law that ha everyone has prized. However, in practice, there's a, a clearly drawn line between uh, citizens and refugees. Uh, there is, even when you go to the community, like in Rwanda, people will tell you that's a refugee school and this is a school. So they are always that, uh, those lines, and those make it difficult. But our approaches for refugees tend to be short term we approach them in a, a mode where we think they will soon go back. So we don't look at their political participation. After all, they are here to go back anytime. That's how you find the approaches. The other approach is that uh, we, we use top-down approach. And this is across board, whether you're an NGO OPM, name it. We sit here and we say refugees need food. We look for money and distribute the food. Tomorrow there is a crisis in the camp. We sit somewhere and decide what to do. Tomorrow we do it. No refugee ever sits in those meetings. We, we decide for them all through. And uh, the, that points to the kind of Political participation, I think, needs to be adopted. The kind of political participation should be around equity, representation. Refugees, I don't think they need to be presidents of Uganda or members of parliament. But I need that equity where they participate in decision making, especially decisions that concern them. If you're going to make a decision about a refugee camp, how what structure do you have and how do you involve that structure of refugees in arriving at that decision? That kind of inclusion is what I think we need to be pushing for. We need a few recommendations. We need to reform some laws and I can tell you that's going to be a, a huge task. Now that I've shown you that the constitution creates us and we, sorry, us and them, <coughs> So some constitutional issues will come into play. But acts like the NGO Act, the Local Government Act, could be amended. Local governments could possibly look at inclusion of refugees in decisions that they are making at their level. Local governments have powers to make bylaws. And if you host local government, possibly you could make a bylaw that seeks to have some representation. For example, you can copy the LC system into a refugee camp and have it effective, working the way it works outside the refugee camp. Uh, for civil society, my colleagues, I think we also are responsible for this. We don't engage refugees that much. We decide for them. We don't involve them in the decisions we make. We look at them as people who will comply, as people we are giving, extending a help for, uh, as people basically who can't make a decision, we should decide for them, and what we've decided is what should be done. So I think we need to a paradigm shift from the civil society, start including some of these people as we arrive at, the, at decisions. That one will eventually lead to some political participation. I had people say the big P and small P. I don't know which of the two, but political participation, that will lead us somewhere. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. And I think, um, I think your point about the fear of the unknown is one that you know, is within all of us in, in any environment. And I think you know, it's, it's easy to default to that. And I think we have to be very proactive. And uh, as you say, a paradigm shift of assuming that there should be no fear of these people who are coming in. And if we can start from that perspective, we probably will be able to move further forward in these conversations. And completely agree with you that um, 
the uh, refugees, particularly and especially on issues that directly affect them, must be engaged and consulted. And if we can even get that far, um, then then we've already made uh, progress, I believe. But uh, yes, there's still much more uh, longer ways to go. Um, and given the length of time people are staying, and and you know, recognizing that uh, refugees. Uh, bring their own personal and positive experiences into Uganda. Um, you know, uh, the diversity of, of knowledge is something that we should all be embracing and learning lessons from other environments can only be a positive um, for our own operating environment. So again, if we just start looking at it from that perspective, um, the, we could find that there'll be a lot of ways that we can benefit from what um, everyone brings to Uganda. Um, so let me hand over to Innocent to uh, present from uh, the Uganda Office of the Prime Minister perspective. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, distinguished uh, participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Innocent Dahirwe. I work with also the Prime Minister in the Refugees uh, Department. And I'm um, honored to be part of this discussion. I saw an email on, uh, earlier this week with this subject, Perspectives of Refugees' Political Participation in Host and uh, Country of Origin, you know, countries. And uh, quickly I asked myself, okay, this is something I had not even uh, probably thought about, that we can convene or sit in a day and discuss refugees participating in Uganda's politics. I also imagined if this came, say, in tomorrow's news daily, front page, what would be the reaction of the Ugandans? What would be the reactions of the countries of origin where we are receiving refugees? Uh, what would be the reactions of our political leaders? So these are the questions I, uh, that really came to my mind. I said, okay, Iri will never stop her music. This is, uh, I said, I really was anxious. I wanted to come actually from yesterday, but I already had other engagements. I asked my colleague to come, but I really wanted to hear these views, and uh, especially on this kind of subject. I also went ahead to check. Has someone really done the research on this before, or oh, it's actually the first time? And uh, interestingly, I got um, a gentleman, or oh, a lady, Eric Anderson, did a research on this in 2013. Uh, political rights for refugees in Uganda, a balance between stability in the state and respect for human rights. I will interest all of you to read it and also see it. And in this research, actually, he was <coughs> studying the question, I think Pecos asked that question, what amounts to political activity? And in his research, he realized that probably he also does not give an answer. So, I will start from the government position. Office of the Prime Minister, for us, definitely, I'm a lawyer, I'm an attorney. I go and advise the, my Prime Minister by the legal framework. We have the Refugee Act, which uh, the researchers here have ably uh, really quoted that refugees cannot participate in politics. And actually, that is the only right that refugees don't have in Uganda. With everyone these days when I'm in meetings within the country, out of the country, before I even address the meeting, Uganda has been mentioned possibly five, ten times with its progressive refugee policies and all that. I've even asked myself, is it why we've lately had this negative publication? Because before everything was good, good. And at one time I even asked myself, how are we going to improve if everyone is saying we are we are doing good. You know you get worried. You think possibly some people are 
it's, it's an innuendo, are they not being, they are telling you you're smart, everyone you're smart. So Uganda refugee po policy, it's very progressive, they have all the rights, they have every, they give land, they give everything. So I'd say, what are we not doing? So should we sit? So uh, the law gives refugees, as you've heard, all the rights, except the right to participate in politics. And I want to share with this gathering that actually, in early 2000, when they were discussing this bill, that time the refugee uh, bill, which became the Refugee Act 2006, they had included the right to participate in politics. The bill before parliament, if uh, my colleague Peter and others who can access parliamentary hazards, there was the original bill they had given the right to participate in national politics, not politics of the refugees' home countries, but in Uganda <coughs> politics. But my friends, you should have been there. You should read the, the member of parliament's reactions to that. And in fact, the Committee on Presidential and Foreign Affairs had to be tasked to respond to that, and it is that committee that framed that section uh, 35 uh, D and E, you see. So section 35 clause E was added in, in that bill, and it became what it is today. And uh, we, of course, Uganda, we, we also we have um, signed treaties, international treaties. I want to also ask you to look at other treaties, you've had perspectives from Kenya, from South Africa. What does the OAU 1969 Convention say on that? What does the 1951 Convention say on that? Okay, so you'll find that all these are actually talking the same thing. Naturally, states have that principle of sovereignty. All of us here, Ugandans, uh, Congolese, Rwandese, Germans, we have a country we call our country. Lately, we have seen the, even when we have the resettlement programs, we have seen the United States of America changing, you know? So there is that fear, which probably Peter and, and my previous colleagues have said, as nationals, everyone will want to say, no, this is my country. So whoever is coming in as a visitor, uh, or as a refugee, there, there is that natural, you know, positions from right away the Constitution. Actually, if we are to even amend these acts, we will have to start in the Constitution. Chapter 4 has elaborately talked about it. Chapter 4, probably repeated didn't tell you what it means. I, I think... It comes from the Constitution. Chapter 4, these are really human rights. But uh, I think they also probably, I didn't know uh, that they have limits. Actually, when I was in law school, uh, that was part of the issues. Where do human rights uh, stop? Are they really 360 degrees? <laughs> but you realize that possibly they are not. So that's where... I think uh, Uganda comes in and as an individual I want to really think that Uganda has actually opened up more than most of the countries on the globe. That Uganda will even, probably even the same political activities, they will, they will close an eye even when there are some political activities going on, which have actually almost brought us as government even issues in the name of trying to give some space, in the name of trying to, you know, let human rights uh, go on, in the name of letting uh, gatherings, uh, people be. Like I would say, the right of movement currently for refugees, which is quite unique, which other countries are now trying to to emirate, it's now bringing us issues. 
we, we thought it's the best, everyone will be happy. But now, when you say refugees have a right to move, to settle anywhere. Now, we are being asked to account for refugees, say, in Nachivan. We have 10,000 10, people registered there. But 5,000, after registering, have moved to Barara, others to Kampala, others to Gulu. So, when World Food Program goes there, they are only 5,000 on the ground. And they say, so the other five are ghosts. Where are they? We don't know where they are. Some are in Kampala. Other, should we now tag? So we are, you see how dynamics, some time back it was okay, it was fine. Security cautioned us, no, 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 how will we implement? We said, you know, security in the whole country. So if a refugee is registered in Achivari and is doing some small business in Barara or in Chisoru, and he does anything contrary to the law, then you'll deal with him. You'll face the law. He does not need to be in Achivale, confined there, not to live there. If he's to live, he must give permission and so on. But now, with these kinds of dynamics, I don't know, maybe they may again say confinement, you see? So it's the same thing when you talk of refugees, political participation. What comes to your mind? If, okay, you're from South Sudan, you're in South Sudan, live around the current situation, and this topic comes, how would it be responded? As government, we receive, we permit, we are open to refugees coming in. And when we receive and really give grant asylum, we have pledged to protect all these refugees, okay? If anything happens to aid of them, then as government will be tasked to account. That's why we, I had even some comments from, from the gentleman here, uh, a, a question about uh, refugees being abducted. So it becomes a serious issue. So some of the uh, activities or some of the things we have to do as government is to ensure that refugees live in a way that also does not endanger them. Okay? If we are going to probably imagine if this law was saying if it had kept the way it had kept, would the situation be different from the way it is? Would refugees be more safe in Uganda than they are or they would actually be more unsafe? Would insecurity be more if they are trying to kidnap them from Uganda when they are not participating in politics? What about if they were? And there is a certain political party, OLF, in Uganda, for say, Eritrea. Then how would Uganda relations with that country be? So I want us to be open. These are questions I have been thinking of around. Uh, but on the other hand, I also wanted to say that maybe with this topic, it again triggers uh, our minds as government to see how we can rate refugees or what kind of politics can refugees participate in, in, in more or less really leadership roles. The word politics is heavy. <coughs> if you're going to define, if anyone asked you, when you woke up, what is politics? You will not quickly think of it in terms of leadership, in terms of... The mind runs into elections, the mind runs into subversive activities, the, you know. So for Uganda, we have said that let us have leadership roles, let refugees uh, have leadership roles within their communities. In settlements where we have organized settlements, we've let refugees have uh, welfare councils. Welfare Council 1, Welfare Council 2, Welfare Council 3, with the chairman Welfare Council 3 as the leader of the refugee community. And our argument here is that it's to help us manage. You can never be in a group, even in prisons, once you reach the prison, they are leadership roles, okay? 
So that's our argument. And that's how we managed to sustain actually these refugee welfare councils. So probably we should go ahead to see that these are legalized and see how maybe they can work even with the host communities, but without necessarily going into the national the national uh, politics. Actually, I think I'll cross-check in the local council regulations. Anyone can, even if you're not a Ugandan, you can be a member of that uh, committee, okay, in, in that area. But still with the Local Governments Act, there is some kind of contradiction with it. So it's a subject that we have to take uh, with extra caution because it can, in my view, probably worsen the, 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 the security of the refugees. But if we can emphasize, if we can uh, uh, ensure that refugees are able to, to, within their communities, in the settlements, be able to have the leadership like they're having, then we tap from that uh, leadership kind of welfare committees to work with them in now discussing decisions, in uh, listening to their views, in uh, involving uh, them even at national level, like we have started doing under the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework, then we'll be able to have everyone involved in decision making on matters relating to refugees. But the politics should be politics within refugees. We've been asked why can't we have the same kind of uh, approach in urban areas, refugee welfare council committees in urban areas. But we are still studying this, uh, the, 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 the issue to see how best we will do that in Kampala, in Barara, in Guru, in every district. Because there is a tendency to also say that urban areas, uh, refugee urban, uh, urban refugees are refugees living in Kampala. What about those living in Barara town, those in Guru town, those in Arua town? You see, how do we categorize them? They are urban refugees. Okay. So, let us uh, look at, for me, I will take this in a more or less uh, of evolving refugees in decision making in matters that affect them from the settlement levels up to the national level. Then I want to talk something more about naturalization. <coughs> Refugees definitely can be able to participate if they are naturalized as Ugandan citizens. There's been increasing concern that why can't refugees be naturalized in Uganda? And as government, as a office which manages uh, or which deals with refugee matters, we have also said that it's something we need to really explore. And it's something we are trying to discuss as an alternative uh, solution to uh, you know, refugee uh, issues. This issue was uh, pushed so hard that it even reached our constitutional court. Uh, I will, I think, unfortunately, I didn't come with a decision, but it would be very good for you to check out that decision of the Constitutional Court, interpreting the question on whether refugees can be Ugandan citizens, can be naturalized, can be registered uh, and become citizens. And that court uh, mentioned categorically one that refugees who are born in Uganda. Here in Uganda, we don't have uh, citizenship by birth unless one of your parents is a Uganda. Two, a refugee cannot be a citizen by registration. The constitution also does not permit it. But the co court interpreted that a refugee can be a Ugandan by naturalization. 
but they said that the petition which was before them had not brought evidence to show that there are refugees who had tried to apply for citizenship by naturalization and they had been refused. Okay? So, from what I find, citizenship is under the mandate of the Minister of Internal Affairs and it's the mandate of the board. Mm? They have said that uh, when you look at the Act, Citizenship and Immigration uh, Control Act, in a way, I think Section 25 also limits uh, that provision because it says you can be a citizen by naturalization if you have been here, among others, you've spent 20 years, but in the 20 years they say not as a refugee. Okay? So the, the spirit behind this is that when you fled or when you flee to come and you become a refugee, you fled temporarily. This is a temporal uh, kind of gesture or act. But recent times now show that we are having refugees who are spending even 20 years. Okay? So, there will be possibly a need to look at all these laws, like my colleagues have said, uh, 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 Councillor Peter, to see how probably with the recent times, with now having this kind of protracted nature of refugee, we can put all these laws in tandem to look at these kinds of issues. Uh, my last one is on uh, the question that was raised in the earlier panel on deportation of refugees. I cannot also live here without responding to it. Uh, we've had a few incidences, and I'm glad to say that as government, we don't condemn, condone that. And uh, there is even a case on going in court with arrest of prosecution. You cannot completely stop some criminal elements, as government, as states, you will always endeavor to fight these criminal elements. Okay? So there is a court case ongoing. Some people are apprehended, and they are before court being prosecuted. So it's uh, not our making, and as government of Uganda, we'll do our best that the refugees we receive in, the refugees we get, are protected to the best of our ability. I thank you. Thank you so much, Innocent. And I think, um, if, if nothing else, I'm, I'm sort of so pleased to hear that uh, the, uh, the suggestion of this meeting at least provoked the questions that we've been able to discuss here at, at, the, at, at the meeting. And I think, for me, what's really important is that, uh, you know, if this is one of the fundamental things we need to be able to talk about these things to find solutions that are mutually acceptable and mutually beneficial and um, you know we're as you said at the beginning uh, Uganda ran into a small a positive problem recently of being the best place to be a refugee and where do you go from there so I think it's very um, you know, we, we need to be evolving, and, and you're very right to point out that we need to make sure that the evolution is a positive evolution. And uh, we do have to be very careful that uh, when we are advocating for uh, changes, that we don't end up with unintended consequences that are then detrimental. And I think that's very uh, sage advice for us all in this regards, because I feel like everybody in the room here is, is looking for positive involvement and, and, and forward movement on these things. Um, but we have to be aware that, um, that, that, that there may be, uh, that the results of efforts may, may not be to uh, a positive degree. But I want to thank all my panelists for uh, their very useful and, and insightful contributions, both from the perspectives of uh, individuals who are in uh, refugee situations currently, but um, whilst happy to be here for the time being actively, I'm, I'm assuming would like to go home, and, but also to get the perspective both from uh, Ugandan government and uh, 
uh, representative of uh, the Ugandan population um, and NGO worker because I think this is this is what's important is that we have to recognize that this is a complicated and complex conversation and um, I think for me as long as we can have these conversations we are already um, in a positive place there are many environments where these conversations would not even be possible and I think we shouldn't take that lightly um, and that we these conversations by starting these conversations we can already um, uh, arguably maybe we are already engaging in politics, but um, let's not let's not worry about that today. But I think um, you know, again, looking at uh, with the the report, looking at eight different case studies in eight different countries, we can also look at um, and and recognise where where we are here in Uganda. Um, look at uh, positive examples from other countries, but also recognise where we are presenting positive examples to some of the other countries in the case studies. So I think that's why um, I feel that this report is, is particularly um, useful for us all as refugee advocates, um, both here in Uganda, but also uh, internationally. Um, so please uh, thank my panel, but then we'll do the floor for questions. But a round of applause, please. Unfortunately, I can't seem to get the other microphone to work, but if you can, Lena. Thanks so much for the panelists and for the nice discussions. As, I, as I've said, my name is Pecos. One thing which is missing is this morning, let me take an example of the Congolese refugees here in Uganda. I've been following the Congolese refugees in Uganda since 2000 when I came here. The fact is, the Congolese refugees do participate actively in politics here in, in Uganda, either at local level, or either within Uganda or outside Uganda. There are quite a number of interesting reports where Congolese refugees have been recruited to go and fight to, to back to Congo. These are the recent report of Human Rights Watch in December indicated that refugees were picked from Rwanda, went to Kinshasa, killed people, and came back. So I think it's the question that at the local level, let, let's look at the other element which we haven't said. At the local level, there were C systems, which Mr. Inos have said. They are Congolese, actually, they are Congolese refugees who are the Rwasis in that, that kind of systems. But these refugees, the question is, who participates? I, I think that's where probably the, the world could look into the broader situation. <laughs> and those who participate will find that they are more lenient to the regime or they are more lenient to the governments in place. And probably what we'll find out, what should have been in the discussion, so we'll look into the other category of refugees who would like to participate in politics, but in a more independent manner. That's, I think, one among the areas which is, is trying to, to miss the discussions I have seen this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Joye Mugisho. I'm a refugee leader. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Innocent. Uh, it's, um, I wouldn't talk much about politics since my colleague has said quite interesting things. Uh, if uh, talking about naturalization of refugees, uh, we are looking at uh, the durable solution for refugees. And if naturalization, which is a uh, local integration is impossible, why are we still looking at it as a durable solution? Because you are very clear there that to be granted a citizenship in Uganda, you have to have lived in Uganda for 20 years, but not as a refugee. Thank you. Bonjour encore. Euh, J'étais malade, mais aujourd'hui, je, je suis content. Aujourd'hui, j'étais content parce que j'ai retrouvé un Rwandais réfugié qui a accepté qu'il était Rwandais. Pourquoi cette question Pourquoi ça Je suis Congolais. Et au début, j'ai aimé la présentation. Mais à la fin, j'ai eu peur comme le gouvernement de l'Ouganda. Pour l'intérêt de mon pays. 
à la fin, j'ai eu peur, comme le gouvernement de l'Ouganda vient d'avoir peur pour l'intérêt de mon pays, le Congo. Pourquoi j'ai dit ça Et Je l'ai dit parce que je suis avec un officier du gouvernement de l'Ouganda. Je n'acquise pas. Mais je demande si c'est possible. Il n'y a pas de réfugiés. La plupart des réfugiés rwandais et burundais sont devenus congolais en Ouganda. Alors si tous ces réfugiés rentraient chez nous pour aller influencer la politique dans notre pays, si c'était votre pays, comment vous pouvez considérer ça Ils ont changé. Like as Congolese. Supposing one day they go back to Congo, do you imagine what they are going to cause in Congo as conflict or problem? Yeah, that's one. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, yeah, you have understand me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's one. It's, no, let me finish. <laughs> so, uh, je me uh, quand il y a des recherches pareilles, je ne le vois pas comme une blague. Je peux les projeter après 20 ans, quelles seraient les conséquences, quels seraient les avantages aussi. Bien sûr, je ne suis pas dans mon pays et aujourd'hui je ne peux plus rentrer parce que je n'ai pas mon identité. Le gouvernement a tout repris. Moi, je peux vouloir, si un réfugié venait en Ouganda, s'il a sa carte et s'il a son passeport, qu'on lui remette ça. Parce qu'il reste congolais d'après. Like euh, je ne vais pas apprendre le gouvernement de l'Ouganda comment identifier les réfugiés, mais en tant que Congolais, je peux proposer comment nous identifier. Au Congo, nous avons des Chinois, Libanais, Belges, Français, Allemands, Américains qui sont Congolais aujourd'hui. C'est comme les États-Unis. Pourquoi ces gens sont Congolais aujourd'hui on, 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 nous sont, on les a, on, on identifie pas ces gens par face, par face ou par quoi, mais nous nous identifions par nos valeurs et notre culture. Alors, comment le gouvernement de l'Ouganda, parce que pour moi comme Congolais, je vais le dire. Euh, comment le gouvernement de l'Ouganda s'autorise de donner ou d'octroyer la nationalité congolaise à des gens qui ne sont pas des Congolais Sans pour autant prendre considération de nos valeurs et de notre façon, de, de nos cultures. Peut-être, je peux apparaître Congolais. Mais Ted, il apparaît soudanais, mais par rapport à ce qu'il tire, il est beaucoup plus congolais que moi. Avec la... Moi, je connais toujours la Nation Zénie. Et je vais le dire, s'il y a un officier de la Nation Zénie, si je vais vraiment, vous allez m'excuser. Comment vous pouvez sélectionner les Allemands, mais ces Allemands, on, on sélectionne un Allemand, mais qui parle chinois Merci. 
Thank you. We uh, have this uh, mic back, so um, I'll pass to the panel. Um, it was pointed out to me, and, I, and I, I second this, that we haven't had many women who have asked questions or commented from the floor. So while, uh, okay, so one already, but while the panel are asking, can uh, some of the uh, ladies in the room, uh, I mean, uh, if you want to, um, but please let's, uh, let's try and uh, make this uh, open. Lena, you'll be the next after the panel speaks. Thank you. Uh, okay, I, I think um, just uh, to respond to a few, because the questions didn't, were not specific to, to the issues. Uh, my brother, the, the, the Congolese, I didn't record his name. Alex. Uh, Alex. I find it interesting that um, I come from Western Uganda. I'm in Toro to be specific. And I find it interesting when I'm, interest, I'm uh, interacting with the the HEMA in DRC, whom we share a lot in culture. But uh, if I was to interact with the Lendu, possibly I would be chased from there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, the cultures uh, have good and bad, and maybe we need to look at how to integrate that. Because um, the truth be told, uh, when I'm in DRC, if I introduce myself by my culture, in my culture we have pet names and all that. So if I introduce myself to the Hema with all that, I'm as good as I'm in Uganda. But if I'm in a Lendu community, I would possibly have to hide my identity because uh, of the... So if we had Lendus in Uganda, maybe it would be easy to integrate them and also look at how we can have the other ones. Uh, there, there was uh, Pecos talked about um, some Congolese participating in politics and others, like the the case he talked about in um, uh, in Rwanda, where some uh, some uh, refugees are alleged to have gone to DRC and uh, uh, committed crimes. Uh, we've also had them. I think uh, my colleague would answer a few things around that. And uh, I remember there was a time when uh, they came and removed some refugees because they were M23, uh, or at least believed to be M23. But that's not the reason, I think, why we are talking about political participation. We should draw a line between uh, peaceful political participation and commission of crimes, which is something totally anyone would be against. So the Congolese in Uganda or any other refugees maybe could be participating in having their voice heard, <coughs> representation, or participating in issues that caused them to run away from their country without necessarily committing crimes. That's what I think should be the way forward. Um, thank you very much uh, once again. I will not uh, comment on all questions. I will just comment on uh, Pecos's question because the other question went uh, directly to, to Mr. Innocent. And I believe that he is the best person to, to answer them. Um, I think that's where I talked about um, you know, uh, refugees being prevented from participating in politics. It creates... Um, a lot of danger actually because um, now like this case that you've spoke about this is not uh, participating in the politics uh, formally but this is again informally but which is really a dangerous situation to even uh, refugees that are in Uganda and even uh, to the citizen of uh, the country of, of their country of, of origin uh, I really think that um, there is need um, to give refugees a space, you know, to, to formally participate in politics so that uh, such issues can easily be mitigated and uh, come up with a clear plan and some limitation on what to do and what not to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'll just answer Peko's question on participation of refugee leaders, uh, specifically the RWCs. Uh, you mentioned this point that there are, the people that are selected 
or that the uh, RWCs are more lenient to the regime, let's say the OPM and the UNSCR, than to the refugees that they are uh, representing. Uh, my brother, the whole equation is just complex because it is not only them. The RWCs that we have here are not people that present our voices. What they give to us is just, it's just one-sided. They only give information, what are the ideas from the refugees, but they don't give us feedback. And let me give you an example. The, the CRI you was mentioning here, I was on the meeting on the 31st of January. So they had six priorities that they were selecting. <coughs> they said, look, in Uganda, the refugees are going to be given water, uh, energies, there is quality education, and all those stuff. So I, I put up my, my name tag and I asked, we are here in this room discussing, prioritizing things that are supposed to be given to refugees. But did you consult them? Are these the things that they want? If you go to Nakiba, are the needs the same as those who are in Ajuan? Those who are in Ajuan might have just arrived on them. Uh, they might just arrived from South Sudan after seeing atrocities. Do they just need uh, biscuit? Do they need food? And here we are talking about quality education. When we have not even given access to education yet, why do you prioritize quality education when access to education is not, is it not in, in place as, as, as planned? I did not quote anything about the policies which are in place. The Ugandan policies, they said it's very important, it's very good, and it is being praised all over the globe. But do, is, are there refugees that are working anyway? Or they're the ones creating their own jobs? UNHCR is responsible for refugees. It is UNHCR, High Commissioner for Refugees. But if you go to their office, you will not spend a single refugees, not even a translator. They only need you when... No one. When the, no one. So, we have these policies which are very good written, they are global written, but they are not applied. So, writing policies is one thing, writing reports is the second thing, but the third thing is implementing them. These people are working on systems that are devolved. They are not devolved in Uganda. The UNSR system is not devolved in Uganda. It is, they are accountable to the state. The other question I asked about to them was the accountability system that we are having. It is only one-sided. Why do you not account to the people that give us the money and not account to the people that are receiving the money? We are the people that are benefiting from the money that, are, that is being given to us. But we are not given any space to ask that this money should not be used for, for things like uh, things which are not important to us right now. The money should be used on this. They are, they are not accounting to us. So if the RWCs bring all these questions on the table, they are not being what, given an ear. So when they come back, the refugees, they have nothing to, to tell you. They have nothing to report to you. So what comes? There's always a conflict. That these guys are being lenient to what? To the refugees regime. But in actual sense, they have the voices being forwarded, but there's no one who is giving them any feedback. There's no one who is giving them any, any room. People say that we have, like the political system, we should be given the space to, uh, to engage politically. If we're not going to create it ourselves, there's no one who is going to, what, to give us the space. So whether it's formally or non-formally, we have to make sure that when you're at home, you have to educate your kids that, you know what, if you know you are born in Uganda, your country is South Sudan. One day we shall go back to South Sudan. So you must know the history of South Sudan. So if you don't know your history, you have to teach your kids their history. If they know their history, one day they have to go back and then participate fully. Accountability is something very complex. The donors is that are giving us the money to be used among, okay, with the refugees situation here in Uganda, are the people that are supposed to change their way, the ways they look at things. Because they give UNSCR and other agencies a lot of time accounting, accounting to them, not spending time with us. You'll find them in the offices, replying to emails, replying, like following our policies, instead of coming to us and then talking to us. So how do you, how do you see that there is transparency here? It's something which is very complex. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. I really love seeing this young man, passionate and able to express himself. I think this is what the government of Uganda can best give, yeah. that people <laughs> should express themselves, tell Andy that should not account to the donors, but account to the, 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 the stakeholders. <laughs> so we are no longer in this alone, Andy, as OPM. <laughs> I think you can see. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's really good. And I think I'm always proud to be a Ugandan because it's only really in Uganda where we even call the president anything. And no one will even bother to come and uh, say, why did you say the president? You find our president in a cartoon, in a newspaper. 
and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we, we really have the space. We have the space and uh, our refugees have the space. But again, I caution, let us not go beyond. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> yes, do not test again the other side. We have, we really, we, we have the space, we can speak, we can, uh, you know, have uh, refugee human rights defenders, they can write opinions, and we really, they also inform. But again, let us not go beyond to make statements that can cause international or cause states to, you know, kind of have conflict. At the end of the day, we might cause ourselves problems. I don't need by I say the message. Yes, yes. Okay. So, and uh, because you are, you've informed me that Congolese are going, Congolese refugees are going to Congo to vote. For me, this is news, and if it's happening, it is illegal, and we shall not legalize illegalities. Yes. If it comes to really our, our, our attention properly through security, I'm going to, I've taken it, I'm going to take it through our external and internal security agencies, definitely there will be issues. It's not proper, and I don't encourage it. The laws are clear, and please, Refugees, you cannot participate in the national politics or politics of your country of origin. If you want to participate in the politics of your country of origin, you can always go back. And uh, we have always, actually, it's one of uh, the challenges, uh, refugees moving back, even without our knowledge, and then come back without our knowledge, using various polar borders. But uh, it's not a good practice. And uh, let us, if you're a refugee, you be a refugee. If you want to be in Uganda as a national of your country, be a, a national of that country, because we also have them here. And uh, the rights are really all good. So my emphasis on that is refugees currently are not supposed to participate. And if there are some who are doing so, it's not proper, it's illegal, and uh, you risk or you likely to face the law. Then uh, refugee welfare council committees. This has been even a big uh, concern which has been raised in the recent allegations. But we are it's under investigations. We hope the reports will be able to tell us. But I want to mention that as any elections, even in this room. If Andy said, let us have an election of a leader, or a five-man committee, I can assure you there will be some corporates after. Yes. Humanly, they are bound to be. And for refugee settlements, because, as I mentioned, actually these were fair committee councils, these are administrative uh, kind of uh, efforts. So. Possibly moving forward, we may need, like we have the Elections Act, the National Elections Act, Member of Parliament Elections Act, we may have the Refugee Welfare Council Elections Act, so that we know clearly who, who, who does what, there is even an electoral body to conduct that, but all of this requires resources. Moving forward, maybe in the long term, it's what we'll have to do. But uh, these corporates, we've received them, and I don't want to go much into, we'll be able to get a report and be able to respond most probably on that. But it's majorly, naturally, you'll find those kinds of corporates. And uh, Mugisha, you asked, uh, why are we looking at naturalization, yet uh, we are saying it's not possible? We all agree that it is very good, and uh, that's why, for us who are passionate of refugee uh, matters, as one of the durable social, we are trying to champion it, we are trying to push for it to the extent that if there are even any legal barriers, we see how they can be amended or, you know, rectified so that it is possible. Because I don't find it logical for someone to be here for 25 years. 
and then you saying I know only Uganda. I mean, if an alien or another national from Congo is here and has not been a refugee and can be able to benefit from that, why not a refugee? Mm -hmm. And that's our argument and that's what we are trying to. But it's something you must take cautiously, as you know, it touches some political elements. So it's, it's something we are pushing, and if it needs problem amending the law, uh, the acts, we are trying to take it slowly to see that it can be one of the alternative uh, solutions to especially protracted refugee case laws. And the last is uh, uh, Alex, that Rwandese and Burundians registered in as Congolese refugees. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> and uh, definitely it will call, if it's happening, to call for us to not only even work alone, but also work with you people who can able help us and tell us that actually this is a, a Rwandese, no, a Burundian, not a, or a Kenyan, or not a Congolese, or the other way around. Of course, it also sends a message. Why is this being done? Okay? The cause of that. So, is it because maybe there are security related issues, they don't want to be followed? Is it because one wants to be registered as Sudanese, South Sudanese, because South Sudanese are being given prima facie? And they don't want to do individual status determination? Okay? Is it you to fear to be detected, like someone did say? Or, yeah, that's what I'm saying, to, to get. But um, we've got some cases, I want to assure you, but it's not easy. Uh, I will tell you, I come from Chisoro. Those who know where Chisoro is, like Alex said, we have people who are speaking the same language in Rwanda, we have the people who are speaking the same language in the side of DRC. So it's possibly myself who can easily detect that this is a Rwandese or this is a Congolese. The other time I was in a meeting in Chigari, Africa, uh, Africa Union, but with my delegation every time you know, I met the other participants. Everyone greeted me in Chinyarwan, thinking I'm from Rwanda, because I look like Chinyarwan. So there are those challenges, but they are all efforts to make sure that, and this is the kind of criminal elements I'm even mentioning about. Why would you hide your nationalities? And if we get to find out under the Refugee Act, it is clear, you will, your status will be withdrawn through the Refugee Eligibility Committee. So if you know any as people there, as one, let us know. We shall be able to put that case in the Refugee Eligibility Committee, and the status can surely be withdrawn in accordance with the Act. Because such a person obtained status through fraudulent or misrepresentation kind of means. So we will take care of that. And as for refugees, handing in their passport, on the arrival. You see, when you seek asylum, you've said my country is no longer able to protect me. So you have given yourself to a country to protect you. So we don't expect you, when you're here as a refugee, to again go to Kororo to your embassy to seek services. Okay? <laughs> That's why when you want to travel out of the country, you even come and we give you a conventional travel document. <coughs> so if you want to keep with your passport, where do you want to keep with your passport? Possibly you, those will be the people who want to fly back to Chinsasa, then back to Entebbe, then back. Huh? So it, for me, it does no harm. You hand it in to the, that's a security measure. It's done by security agencies. They keep it. When you want to go back, you go back and they hand you over hand them back the refugee documents. You can't keep both documents. And a few days later, we got a case actually in Mirama Hills, where some people were found with the refugee documents, and again, they were entering the country using a certain country's passports. 
I can assure you that matter reached even the, His Excellency. And it can bring you problems. That's why I'm saying you'd rather carry one document. Thank you. Um, I'm very sorry, we are we're out of time, but um, I'm going to. If, if we can discuss afterwards, and a massive apologies for Lena for asking you to put yourself forward and then telling you that there's no time left to do so. And also to everyone else in the room, I'm terribly sorry, but we are running out of time and we just need to close. Um, I want to, uh, I'll hand over to my colleague Anna who will do closing remarks, but I just want to take a, another opportunity to thank you so much to this panel for your really sort of insightful views and um, the interesting conversation that has come about from the floor. And, and once again, just to appreciate uh, the environment we're in, whereby we can have these conversations and let, let's, let's all work together to ensure that that continues. So thank you very much to the panel. So Anna, over to you. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, just to briefly introduce myself, my name is Anna, and I work for the Robert Bosch Foundation, and I have been working with uh, Lina and Armand uh, throughout this project um, in different phases. I, first of all, I would like to thank Andy and Tigrana thousands of times for, <laughs> first of all, for really doing the research and getting all the, all the and the knowledge and all the information on the ground, but also for, for get, hosting this gathering today, uh, because I think that the value of what, what we're doing would, would have been not even approximately uh, as big if we did not have this, uh, this space here to engage and, and discuss. Um, I, I'm very honored to be able to say a few words in the end. It is a bit uh, also difficult to summarize this, uh, this let's just say complex issues, several times, but let me give it a try. Um, I come from the International Relations Department of the Robert Bosch Foundation, where we believe that it's important to have an exchange on issues that happen in different parts of the world, and we believe that it's important for people to be able to learn from each other. Also, on this. And this issue has been particularly interesting because it is also um, not so present in the debates, which is in the end of the day also surprising, because it, it is an issue that has an impact in the real life out there. It has been discussed in the Sustainable Development Goals, part of the goals of, of building peaceful and inclusive society, both access to citizenship, um, but also enabling of participation. And yet again, it puzzles many people when we, when we introduce it in different forums. And not only governmental representatives, it puzzles really a lot of people who are suddenly faced with a question that is not so much present because this is not, uh, has not been the dominating question when we have been discussing on democracy. And I sometimes wonder why, because in the end of the day, we all are political beings. As Diana Tigrana, and very rightfully, suggested that refugees are only citizens that for a particular time have lost the protection of their, of their country. Fleeing itself, in a way, is also sometimes a political act. Maybe not uh, against a particular party or um, a government, but it's an act in saying that I don't want to participate in war. And that's a statement that many refugees do by, by fleeing also. Um, and even in the, in the in the spaces where it's, there, where it's difficult to participate, as Victor mentioned, discussing the cases in Kenya, refugees still try to organize and participate and create these spaces of participation on a very local and very, very small level in order to improve their lives. Um, so considering this, not forgetting that also it is a complex issue because of different political contexts, but also because of the personal situation of, uh, of people who have fled. Because in the end of the day, there is the, maybe also the pressure to say, okay, uh, this is a temporary situation, and refugees need to, re to return, or this might become a more permanent situation. Um, the reality sometimes shows that we don't know how it's gonna turn out. So considering this from a very individual perspective, it, of course, what, in, what is of course important is to maybe find ways to expand on these opportunities for people. Try to, to support people uh, to, 
develop also into their political skills and to open up spaces in which these skills can be, can be practiced. Whether that benefits the host country, the country of origin, or both in the end, which I uh, hope and assume will be the case, that's a different question. Um, therefore, I'm very, very grateful for all the discussion of today. Uh, thank you so much again for, for organizing the space in which we can we can do this and thank you, thank you everyone for, for sharing your stories at the end of the day.